I want you to live with me and die with me and podcast with me. Not a bad Mason. Thank you. I, I mean, I, it's, uh, I, I, remember when John Hamm busted out of James Mason on SNL? Yeah. It was like he was having a great no. up, and then you're like, is he going like, to do an impression? And he did James Mason. He's got a pocket Mason. And it was like, all right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He's in what sketch? Do. Huh? In what it was sketch? one of those Bill Hader sketches that's like a black and white Vincent Price movie oh, or whatever. Oh. <laughs> Where Hader's just oh. like, come on, guys. It me. was right. That became <laughs> Let me do this shit. the weird receptacle for like, does the host have an impression that is so out of vogue right. that there's no other sketch you can put it in? We need hosts who can do stuff like that again. Absolutely. I was looking for quotes uh, to open this uh, episode with, and I was uh, struggling to find a quote that didn't overly sexualize the podcast. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. You didn't want to do normal guy, normal podcast? <laughs> normal guy, normal podcast. You know? I can't remember a lot of quotes from this movie. I'm I'm just sort of searching my brain. It's I guess really I'll... just the normal guy stuff I remember. Yeah. After I saw it at Film Forum, I went back home and looked up that normal guy scene just to watch it again. It's it is... so crazy in the context of the film. It is so bizarre. And all the comments on YouTube are like, this is bone chilling. This is so scary. This is the scariest part of this movie. This is so upsetting and disturbing. I was like, this is really funny. I, this is so funny. I think it's both. Like, it is very funny, but it does make my skin crawl where the tension of it is, like, unbearable. What drives me insane is the twofold nature of this podcast, of every podcast, perhaps. You're, you're, you're this mixer in my podcast is <laughs> tense and slipping through your fingers. He's kind of like irritable, he's, he's going down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is my madness to keep this to podcast. back into the cup. <laughs> gives me a strange thrill to do so. That happened to me recently where I was wearing like a cheap pair of sunglasses. Yeah. Uh, in the, I was kayaking. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. And, uh, Do you they, lose them? They fell off. No. And they went in the water. And I had the one second where I was like, I can grab them. Yeah. I missed. And it was just like, eh, gone. And they were heart shaped, right? Hmm? They were heart shaped. <laughs> they were no. like, yeah, my Lolita kayaking. You closet. were lying in the kayak, Lolita style, on <laughs> I your love tummy. To just throw off a Lolita vibe on my kayak. Legs thrown up. Yeah. 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 And your wife said, David, what the fuck are you doing? Grab the paddle. David, what the fuck? I wish I, David, I can't. Do what it. the I can't fuck do it. are you? What are I you? can get it for a second and I lose it again. It's almost like it, it's like a, there's a little bit of like male Catherine Hepburn in it, right? There's like a little bit of the right. Obviously, he's an Englishman, but there I'm sorry, is what <laughs> James Mason's from the UK. Well, how uh, do you know that? But there is one of those things where when you see him, you're like, well, of course, this guy was a movie movie star. Sure, he's not. Maybe like conventionally handsome. Sure. He's handsome, but you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. And like he only got famous when he's older. But when you hear him talk, you're like, yeah, but no one else is like that, this. That's the thing. So it's just kind of like, yeah, you got to have this guy in movies. People used to be movie stars because they were just unique. You know, it's kind of what David Niven is like. I know David yeah. Niven was like a genuine sex symbol. Like right. it's not, I'm, you know, but, but like, but Bogart's just like, who else is like this fucking guy? Bogart's, Bogart's like sure. the perfect example of that, where you're like, you read through Bogart's career and you're like, as a young man in theater, his thing was playing like glib upper crust, right, right, blue blood, like fucking rich boys, right. right? And then he becomes like, oh, he ages. He no longer looks like that. Have him be the guy in the back of like the fucking gang, the trigger man. Yeah, At some he was point, the heavy. Like, right. right, I don't know. Just let him fucking be the star of one movie. What are we gonna do? And everyone's just like, who the fuck looks like this and sounds like this? Like this is young Bogey, young girl right. Bogey, uh, where he's a little more debonair. Uh, Right. It's funny that like you read young bogey reviews and they talk about him like he's Bradley Cooper and Wedding Crashers. <laughs> and they're like, this guy's obviously figured out his type. God. Bradley Cooper. All and the Wedding photos Crashers. are like him and Don't like a get me going on Cooper. Sweater Don't with a, this a racket. The yeah. maestro himself? So I can't talk about we it. We can't talk maestro? Well, I mean, we can. We can talk maestro. Maybe, in fact, we must talk maestro. Well, we will talk maestro on blank check whenever maestro do, do come that out. That was like, I yes. woke up in a cold sweat being like, they're going to cover Maestro, right? She literally yeah. texted me at like six in the morning. Asking and, and Maestro do come out, right? We do think. Uh, next year, I believe. Next yes. year. Next yeah. year. Oh, I mean, kicking it. Okay, what the fuck, Maestro? Do you know what Maestro is? No. Uh. It's Bradley Cooper's next directed film. Oh, wow. In which he plays Leonard Bernstein, the famous composer. Steven Spielberg oh, was supposed to direct yeah. it. Developed I, saw it years. Been, I saw him an old man. Yes. He he's general. wearing well, a big prosthetic nose. He's wearing a Bernstein face. He's, yeah. di he's apparently directing in Bernstein voice. Yes. 
Cool. Which, I mean, I don't think he should drop the voice in between what? scenes. If you are the maestro, yes. how are you going to drop maestro when you're being the director? Well, I mean, Which no, is, I in agree. Many ways it's the just maestro. a crazy yes. thing to think because then it's like, oh, it's almost as if maestro himself, Leonard Bernstein, directed a film. But like you work in film. You've, you've, I've, d- I've done you've a few uh, terrible films. The yes. director is the maestro. Correct. Right. Exactly. Always. And I only work with auteurs. You only work with maestros. I only work with maestros. I'm very selective. <laughs> like the, your specific, uh, oh, you know, oh, fuck who, you know, who's the director? Who's bad? I, I don't know. Len Wiseman. Len Wiseman. What? He's not a maestro. I'm not doing. He's not a maestro. Wiseman movie. He's I turned on every Wiseman picture. Yeah. Then they, you keep getting offered. I keep getting offered. I've turned on four consecutive Underworld. Yeah, movies. Yeah, you kept throwing Underworlds at you. Yeah. Oh boy. I, I refuse to play either a Lycan or a. I don't know what the other ones are called. I think they're just vampires. Are they? Don't they have another name? The lichens are the werewolves. They are. Don't the vampires have some code name? Or are they just called vampires? Vampires and lichens. Okay. Is one of them she, called? She's a vampire? No. Yes. She is. Yes. She's not like a vampire Mila? hunter. Huh? Who is? It's uh, uh, Kate Beckinsale. Right. Oh, it's Kate Beckinsale. Uh, uh, is there's Celine. 15 years of, I, I feel, Beckinsale and Wiseman. And Mila and Paul W.S. That's, Anderson. I get these right. pairings The Resident up. Evil and the Underworld. Right. And then both of them occasionally stepping outside to do other screen gems. Where they're of. still basically like wearing a leather jacket and kind right. of just doing the same thing. But, but it was not, just like the yeah. two yeah, yeah, yeah. married couple franchises. But there's one Underworld that Beckinsale is not. Maybe the third? Rise of the Lycans? Yeah, when the Lycans rose. That's the prequel. Which <laughs> that, that was when they were just like, okay, so Kate's not in... Nye on the poster? Let's just put Nye on the poster. I think Michael Sheen's first film. Uh, Michael Sheen, Bill Nye, Rona Mitra. Right. Because yeah. the whole thing is that it's Romeo and Juliet. Mm. Oh. With Speedman is Romeo? Yes. Right. And he's a werewolf. And then, I at like least him. for the first movie. I like him. Bill Nye is one of, he's the Bill vampire Bill Nye's the head father. of the vamps. Right. And I believe Sheen is the head of the, the like The Montague or the Capulet, whatever. Right. right. It's just funny that they yes. were like, I don't know. It's nice. Put something on there. The other thing is, uh, at the time of making the first Underworld film, I believe, if not married, Kate Beckinsale and uh, Michael Sheen were at least strongly together, yes. had a child yeah, yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then and she, then left she him leaves him for Len Wiseman. Yeah. And then they were like, oh. Michael, you going to do the sequel? And he's like, I mean, gig's a gig. And then he's even doing the movies that she's not yeah, in. She's, yeah. Sheen is famously chill about this stuff. There was some video of Sheen and David Tennant roasting each other. Did you see this? They must have been doing a podcast or something. No, I was going to point out the Uma Thurman Stern clip that was making the rounds. Still love him. Of, yeah, talking about Ethan Hawke and Stern being like, he cheated on you. And she's like, so? Right. Cool. Get over it. Cool thing for that a girl is cool. to say. Because this is the thing. I feel like when we were younger, mm-hmm. things like that, it was yeah. like, you know, you'd read the magazines, right? And it was sure. like, Ethan Hawke, like is banished to like bad boy territory forever for doing this unpardonable sure. sin or whatever. And often then you dig into it and Michael Sheen, Kate Beckinsale, they're like, oh, whatever, we're friends. We have a kid together. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. He did like four we're more actors. We all movies. fucked each other. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Ethan Hawke is bad. No way. No. I'm not sure. buying it. about him. Yeah. It was, it was Crudup who was the, the most. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. Because she was pregnant, right? When he left yes. her. My mom like, won't like watch. She months won't watch yeah. Billy Crudup in anything. Crazy. And if he's in something, she's like, you know what? I'm not interested. Yeah. And I'm like, he's good. Crudup and, and Watts ending up together is interesting. Crudup and Naomi Watts? Yes. Together? Currently together. She was with Leave. I know. I she didn't left. even know this. Yes. Yeah. She left Leave. She left Leave. <laughs> 50 ways to leave your Leave. <laughs> she made the decision to leave. Fiber. <laughs> I didn't know that. I had no idea. I, I once saw them together on the platform at Astor Place. Leave and Watts? Platform. Leave and Watts and okay. at least one a child. Yeah. And I thought, there they are. There they are. No, Watts, Watts and Crudup together app. now is interesting. This energy is weird. <laughs> I feel like was... We don't want to talk about that later. Yeah, I feel like I'm just watching you all sort of dance around the topic. Well, just we, like now, in circles. James Mason just set us on some weird path. What, what's up? You know, you, you think we're trying to avoid talking about the movie in question today? There was like the, the late 90s, early 2000s thing where I think that entire actor scene of like Patricia Clarkson, Campbell Scott, Stanley Tucci... Like, there was, like, four or five couples that all seemed to keep crossing yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, And then I feel like Leave and Watts were, like, right hovering outside of that. Mary Louise Parker and Crud Up right outside of that. All the, like, sort of, like, they're movie stars, but they're also serious New York theater actors. Right, mm-hmm. right, 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 Yeah. Right, right. 
Right. And it always just felt like there was there was internal drama and couple swapping and she, then shit like she that. She met Crud up on the set of Gypsy. Which we all remember. The Netflix show Gypsy. Gypsy. I remember. It felt like the first Netflix show where people were like, oh, Netflix shows can be dog shit. <laughs> right. Netflix, not, <laughs> Netflix having a show is no longer automatic. They can have like a prestige show with starring a big Academy actor. Award nominees. It's and can funny be dog how that always shit. happens to poor Naomi Watts where she's like, now I'll do my Netflix show. And everyone's right. like, not interested. Right. Hold the shutter down. <laughs> right. HBO See you like, later. We've got to make as many Game of Thrones prequels as possible. And then she films one and they're like, except for this one. Yeah, no. This one we're not doing. Uh, put this put this next to Batgirl. Yeah, card up. Who knew? Well, you know what? What? Great up. Uh, Thank ben, you. you want to hit stop? Ben, wrap it up. Perfect I'm joking. Up. I'm okay. excited to talk about Lolita. I'm not. Listen. Hey, everybody. Okay. <laughs> oh. Come on. This is a podcast called Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. Griffin and David. It's a podcast about the really bungle that. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> I'm bad neighbor. Did you get nervous? Do you uh, get nervous no. to record? No. No. I you don't. might you sound nervous. I maybe the only time I would get nervous these days is with some sort of like fancy guest. And you are one of them. So like, that's why I'm nervous. Okay. Thank you. Blockbuster Fran Hoffman. It's a podcast about filmographies. Directors who have massive success early on in their careers are given a series of blank checks, make whatever crazy passion products they want. And sometimes those checks clear, sometimes they bounce baby. This is a pretty good example. Of a of a what? Of of someone cashing in a check. I would say so, because this is post Spartacus, correct? Yeah. Uh, which is Kubrick's most successful film. Directed the highest grossing film of its year. And was the biggest hit of its year. Yeah. So that's one reason he probably gets this to make Lolita. But project. of course, I think it's also the fact that Lolita was, despite being controversial, such a bestseller that it was automatically like, well, if you can do that. It could be a hit. Look, this movie does have one of, if not the single greatest tagline of all time. How do they ever make a movie of Lolita? It's, it, it is perfect. It is a great yeah. tagline. And the answer is like, eh, they did not okay With great difficulty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Eh, but but it was know. like, that was the whole fucking marketing hook for this movie of like, how, what are you talking about? How were they allowed to do that? Right. How was he going to find a way into doing this? I, I had not seen this movie since I was in high school. You did see it in high school? I saw it in high school when I was reading the book. And you read the book, sure. Yeah. Uh, they taught that book at your school, right? Yep. Because my, my wife also read it in high yep. school. And I was like, this seems like a terrible book to read I in know. high school. Isn't not, not even the content. It's just too hard. Like, oh, okay. would you, Am I crazy? No, Guess. it's hard. I, it is, but I'll say Guess. this. Like, I've never had to read it for school. I read it yeah. on my own while in college. Mm. College just feels right. It, I don't know. It's just like, it's a fairly dense book language-wise. I just, maybe I'm uh, no, underestimating I, I looked, high school. I agree. It was absolutely, I was such a uh, uh, skim the book, do bare minimum, watch the movie, right. avoid it at all costs. Which isn't really going to help you with this one. No, perfectly. Yeah. but Lolita was one of the few examples where I was like, page one, I was like, this thing's fucking well written. And I just burned through that thing. It was like one of my absolute favorite books I was assigned in high school. One of the only ones I not only read, but read like, thoroughly and passionately mm. and then was like and now i get to watch the movie as a bonus sure and, and it's by a Stanley Kubrick Kubrick, right? i watched the movie and i was like this sucks this is not what i like about the book hadn't seen it since had always been looking to revisit it and uh revisiting it uh very recently for this show it is it, it just hit me almost immediately now having the context i didn't have as a high schooler of like oh they not only made a movie out of lolita they made it during the Hayes code yeah mm -hmm. yeah and not dorothy no. Dorothy Hayes. Dorothy Hayes. Character's mm -hmm. name. What's the Hayes code? We'll get it's into like it. It's like pre-MPAA, like, it wasn't like your movie got a rating. It just had to pass the sort of, like, censorship board. But it oh, wasn't. It. Yeah. Right, there was no ratings. There was just a list of things you just, could yes not no. do in movies right. under any circumstances. Wow. And okay. if you got a no, you didn't get to, you know, like, you had you couldn't to get exist. Yeah. Right. You just Which couldn't is... be then released. Or but it's yeah, exactly. Like, not and any, not you're, any you're being checked to that code at every stage of development. At script shooting editing and it's and so like that tagline to... is like can you believe we got it through the code right oh you know that's what they're saying yeah like it's not just like oh this is a, t a simpler time that's right you may have social mores maybe not but maybe the, the, the expression of pre-code movie the movies from like the early 30s especially where they're actually raunchier in a lot of ways yeah Right. Then later, because the code didn't exist yet, and they were kind of like, can we do it? That's like, the thing. Like, there are, like, silent films with nudity, and there are, like, early 30s gangster films that are much more hard-edged, and then there's, there's this 30-year period. There. Fucking horny. Well, yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. shit like Design for Living, yeah. where you're like, this is the most still Ooh. 
a sexually you impressive seen that thing. Movie, Fran? No. Oh. Oh, Fran, you would fucking Designed love. for Living. Designed yes. for Living, great movie. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, um, but, but but then, then the there's a the thirty year in. period where like all of Hollywood is like, how do we like talk around these things? And it's not just sex and but like it's like crime must pay you know right? right you can't have someone who bad guys can't win gets away with it right he's got to go to jail or die or whatever right. it's not just Wait, about that, what so who it's, made it's, those, it's a morality co- this guy named so Hayes weird he was like who he was like a fucking decisions? archbishop or some shit <laughs> he was like the archbishop <laughs> his name was Will Hayes he was the president of the MPAA I he was just a politician he, okay. he, he was like I think he was the postmaster general at some point like it's just like but was uh, it always like he think ran of the, the children, or was the it was was general? really more like morality? Well, yes, the thir- like, yes, you know, it's the thirties yes. is when it starts. At the same time, it's like you know, all kinds of other he went sort of morality. From postmaster public morality. general to this. Well, let's see. Let or me, the let, other way around. That's sort no, of a you know what? No, he was postmaster general uh, from nineteen twenty one to nineteen twenty two in the Harding administration. Okay, and yes, he resigned from the cabinet to become the first chairman of the MPAA. Wow. Now That's he didn't bizarre, institute the Hayes Code for ten plus bizarre years. Bizarre jump. No, ben, well, you know ben, what? You, post yeah. movies. There's a movie a mo- called The Post. Sure. I yeah. hope Louis DeJoy becomes the next head of the MPAA, and yeah, he's yeah. just like, we can't afford it. Um, no more movies. No more movies. Dude, these things are expensive. <laughs> no more rate. You, you think every movie gets a rating for free? I gotta draw the R every time. <laughs> it takes it takes a Don't while. Come cheap. Uh, ben, I I do think it was less about think the children and more about like society is collapsing. Right. Right. How do it was we, like how we need to create standards thing? in society. We need to control storytelling. Right. And it's just like like it, alcohol is bad. Jazz music is bad. You know, like all these things. Yeah. We're just like the fucking the the roaring twenty the thirties things have gotten too loose. We gotta fucking yeah. pull it back. Art art should show you how to live. Right. And it, and this is a very famous poster depicting everything you can't do in the Hayes Code. Okay. So do you want me to read you the Ten Commandments? Yes, please. Thou shalt not show the law defeated. Show the inside of a thigh. <laughs> Lace lingerie? No. Dead man? No, I don't really know what that means. Can't show Narcotics, dead drinking, exposed bosom, gambling, pointing a gun, or showing a Tommy gun at all. It's I think like eventually a weird some list, of this stuff right? softened, obviously. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's of the time, right? Yeah. Tommy guns aren't as much of a thing these days. It, but, would, it would be funny if, like, right now, there was a Tommy gun in like a Disney movie and they're like, it's getting an R. I don't care. Yeah. No one even used it, but <laughs> I can't show a Tommy gun. You can't show a Tommy gun. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the Hayes. Yeah, anyway, no, it's, it's, a, it's a weird lit. And it was like, that's why late, this, the Hayes Code is finally uh, defeated only a couple of years after this film. It's technically 68, but yeah. It's basically and, and diminishing. And then it's like New Hollywood. That's the why there's such a revolution. Yeah. Finally, they had titties again. Like 69, you're allowed to start talking about 69ing again. Um, but this Friend movie is like, like Kubrick I'm himself. Okay. And this is a miniseries on the films of Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. It's called Pod's Wide Cast. Mm. Our guest today is Blockbuster Fran Hoffner. That's me. Blockbuster Zone. Uh, Kubrick always said if he knew how difficult it was going to be to make this movie under the Hayes Code, he wouldn't have made it. Now, you'd think he's a smart guy. You'd think you could have guessed. It's wild. And for a man who's so technical and so obsessed with systems and shit like that. Right. He was just like, well, I thought I had a good strategy for how to do it. And then he got in there and found it was much more difficult and prohibitive than he thought. This book is like a Moby, Moby Dick situation where I think people think they have the upper hand on it and they don't for Go whatever on. reason. Explain sort of Ahab, Ahab metaphor of like, you know. I haven't like, pre-thought this out. I'm just coming in with sort so of whatever. Right like, I know, I know my how head. to tackle this, and it's like, no, the book is beyond your, you know, your flimsy imagination. Have, of how have to, you, yeah. of you how watched the Adrian it. line version? No, I saw it, you know, 20 years ago. Like, yeah. I, so I, I have no memory, but I thought about rewatching it just to, yeah. as context. It's fucking long. It's long. <laughs> it's just it's long. And I, this movie's long too. I know. You know no, I watched wrong. like half of it last night. Yeah. And it do, it just I was just like I'm too skeeved out by this. Sure, is it it's skeevier? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I remember just like it was one of those like classic sleepover rental things where we were like teenagers and we were like, oh my god, this right. is gonna be fuck. And it wasn't. It was like me and a bunch of girls. Is what like yeah. And then it was like 20 minutes and we were like, 
is boring. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, we were teenagers. We were not. Yeah. It's sort of just an unadaptable book. Yes, absolutely. In a way that I think a lot of okay. Nabokov is unadaptable. Ex- but not only is it unadaptable, I think, and I agree with, like, but you, two pages into this book, I would just be like, oh, how would I do this? Right. Forget it. Like, no, it's, right. it's, it's, so, it's plainly unadaptable. Yes. It's so voicey and yes. the prose is so rich and dense that that is never going to be something that succeeds on the big screen. So no. all you can take is the premise. Right. And that premise is tough. The premise it, is tough. It's and something then, you don't want to have to actually witness. But, and, and not only that, it's very hard to put people in the situations to enact it. But I don't, I, no, but it's also just like, it's boring. Like, you know, a lot, I mean, like, just like literally like putting shit on screen, like a lot of it is just them having these like sort of charged conversations. The events of the book are not that interesting. What is interesting yes. is the internal life of this yeah, guy. And that, yeah, and that prose is riveting, which yes. is sort of what they really can't figure out how to translate. Is like, this was a real page turner book for right. me. How and you- this movie is kind of, D- dramatically patchy, I guess. Absolutely. Very saggy at times. And, and the Adrian Line version does the voiceover and it like lifts as much of the language as possible, which feels like yes. the smart move to do if you're trying to do the anti Kubrick Lolita like 30 years later. Yeah. But the second you have Jeremy Irons in full like broken skis ball, like Jeremy Irons, I'm in Dead Ringers, Reversal of Fortune. I love playing these cursed men yeah, and yeah. butterfly roles. The second you have him reciting that dialogue, you're just like, this is unbearably sad. This is just the most mm-hmm. pathetic broken man in the world. I don't want to live with this guy. Which, you know, you know Mason does kind of get there at the end. And I think the point of view of this movie hates this guy yes. enough for it to kind of work where he's both tragic and funny. Right. But it's so weird because it's like, to some degree, he's kind of like a comic fool. To another degree, he's so much more sort of like, charming and sophisticated than the character ever reads in the book. But in other ways, he's so much more pathetic and skeevy than so, the character oh, ever oh, reads Oh, so a book. guy in academia? Just kidding. Hey, um, hey yes, just, yes, but yes, like, yes. J- the latter half, like, where he's, like, bickering with her, you just, that's where it's, you're, like, you're just like, oh, God, he's so pathetic. Like, that's where you're really, I'm really losing interest in yeah. the action on screen yeah like, once it's i'm sort just of like i can't deal with this if it's from like are crazy. they gonna get away with it to right. like can he even make this work right. it's sort of like, like well i don't is this? want no. him to make it work so right. and, and exactly and it's like beyond any moral it's like she's a teenager like what do you think's gonna happen like she's gonna have teenage things she wants to do like when he's arguing with her about like doing the play and all that i'm just sort of like the fuck do you, you think she just wants to hang out with you? You suck. <laughs> the, the other weird thing about this movie. <laughs> what is he a professor of again? French, liter- French oh. literature. Yeah. Well, you don't Come want to talk man. about Flaubert with this guy for yeah. a couple hours Not and have a glass guy. of wine go to bed? No. no. But then he is James Mason, so sometimes you are like, look, I mean, he's James Mason. I'm charmed. Or I'm at least, uh, you know, right. I'm interested. Like, he's he's interesting to I, watch I feel like talk. this is the thing that I... I feel like I will hear actors say this a lot when they sort of people who love James Mason are obsessed with him as a movie star. He's a great movie star. Will say like, and the fucking courage to do that role at that time, at that point in his career. Like that's the thing that separates him from the other movie stars. Yeah. Is that like that on paper should be the most ruinous thing to do where if you do it well, you're going to get tagged with it forever. And if you do it poorly, it's embarrassing and he's actually weaponizing his own screen persona. He's not trying to create some new character to fit into this project. Yeah. It is kind of incredible he makes it out of this movie, like, alive. That it's, oh, totally. You know? He might it, give the best... I mean, I don't think there's really a single weak performance in it. Yeah, it's, no, I think there's I, yeah. good performances and weird performances. I, no, I like yeah. all four performances. I yes. think they're all interesting. Yeah. yeah. But like they them. all have such different effects on the movie. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, we're just going straight into the meat of this thing because I, I don't know how else we talk about it. But it's another weird thing about like the exact moment in time this movie was made that I don't think is as much of a thing if this film is made five years later is, you know, the character in the book is 14 or 12. 12. And she's aged up in this to... 14. Right. Mm-hmm. And Sue Lyon at the time is 16? No. She's, she's 14. She's 14. This is, okay, so this is the whole thing. Yeah. I know that she's actually young in this movie. Yes. I even thought she was two years older than she was. Right. 
watching this, it feels like a 25 year old playing a teenager. It, she, she, she does read old. There's but no I question. Think that's so much the child acting oh, style okay. of that moment. Sure. Right? Where she's like giving like a Haley Mills performance where it's like, there are no naturalistic child performances right. she's, of this time. She's got a lot of poise or whatever. I don't she know. She's in like well, an Andy yeah. Hardy movie or whatever. Child performers at that time, I think, are either pitched up or pitched down. Right. But they're not playing right to like sort of Teenagers the Elsie really Fisher right. eighth grade kind exactly. of thing where you're like, oh, this is genuinely what a 13-year-old right. like is like. If this movie is made five years later, you have someone giving like a Jodie Foster-esque performance. Right, right, right. Yeah. But at this moment, you have someone giving like an Andy Hardy, like, live-action Disney movie-style performance in a provocative film where I'm just the whole time, like, I know this is actually a child and somehow it feels like an adult playing a kid on a teen show, which lends such an odd air to the thing. I guess. I don't know. I mean, the, my whole thing is with the book, which I read years ago, mm -hmm. and I reread for this podcast. Humble you Brand. did. I did. You you told me not to do that. Well, I didn't want to stress you out. Oh, I see. I, I just said like you don't you don't have to do it because you said oh, oh maybe I'll reread and I was. Just I really to wanted like, to reread, but yeah. okay. Um, if I had known, now it's I'm actually like, really I guess I forbade her from rereading. She wanted to do it. And France, her own woman. <laughs> David doesn't like me when ocean. I'm reading. You know, oh, he hates you. You start getting ideas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny because my memory of this book was like they go on a road trip and then it ends. But it is sort of like, yeah, they go on a road trip and then it kind of just ends. Yeah. Yeah. That is the book. It's not heavily plotted, which is maybe no. why. Well, the, but, I, I mean, and Kubrick says this and I'll read some quote from later. But like, you know, the first chunk of the book is you being like, is he is this just going to be about him being obsessed with someone from afar or is right. there going to be movement? Mm -hmm. And then there's suddenly movement. Right. right. She died. You know, all that happens very quickly. And you're like, holy shit. And then the road trip part is sort of like, you know, there's some suspense to that, obviously. And there's all the stuff with the hotel that is not really, you know, all, all the hotel visits. But it's why he moved the quilty killing up to the top of the movie is he's like, otherwise the balloon is deflated and then something shocking happens at the end. Right. If I have a sense of inevitability hanging I think, right. over. I think the right decision. Yeah. I, 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 or I understand the decision from the film perspective, 100%. But then, like you say, and then it's just kind of like, okay. It also then makes it so much of a quilty movie. Well, which mm -hmm. then the performance is only intensified, but you're yeah. like, the whole movie is about like, who the fuck is this guy? Whereas in the book, that's less of a thing. Like, that guy is not that weird. No, no. And, and it He's takes a kind very of a long time for you to really clock, like, oh, there, you know, this, there is a person he's. He should be worried about. Right. Yeah. It's much more abstract. He is always looking over his shoulder and like, wait, who's this? And like, you know, but like, Obviously, it's not like, and then I talked to a guy with weird glasses. You know, like, it, it's right. not this as movie, exaggerated. He's like the thing. Yeah, well, you're you know, like, there has to be something. It's, I mean, like, what the no, fuck? No, I'm saying he's like the thing. Like, John Carpenter's the thing. Like, he's this, oh, like, shape yeah, 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 yeah. like, shit. What is disturbing the ecosystem here? Um, what is the oh, threat man. I can identify? I reread, but I reread the book, and I was, again, just astonished. At, right, like, it is, the whole experience of it is you being in his head and his just, like, layers of sort of, self-aggrandizement and justification and patheticness and like it's just so fascinating to read and it's so yeah. beautifully written and I just again was reading it and I was like yeah no wonder this movie doesn't totally work like how the right. fuck do you put any this is this is literally just James Mason darting his eyes around is how you dramatize not that, only that but I don't know like, like how, right. how do you do that not not only that but like the whole origin of this book is Nabokov being like I'm so fucking good at writing everyone tells me my prose is untouchable let me give myself a real challenge What's like the hardest protagonist to make relatable in any way? Oh, I'll write a book about a pedophile. Like that was his whole thing was, here's like the most sort of monstrous archetype in our society. Mm. And I'm going to try to write a book inside of this guy's head that at least makes you see the world through his eyes and understand him, if not like him. Sure. I Which he succeeds in doing pretty much by the virtue of being better at prose than anyone. He is pretty good. Yeah. But you're like, oh, the thing that sells that is his command of language. And the second you try to move that into a different medium, you're like, well, then how do you fucking do this? I would agree with that. Fran, do you have book thoughts that you want to? I know I forbade you from reading the book. And I, I eternal sunshine to you. So you don't have, you don't remember the book. You also burned every copy of it. I did. I got <laughs> it out of here. No, I was looking up. Cancel Alina. If there have been other adaptations of different Nabokov 
works that I know of, and I don't oh, sure. think there have been. Oh, really? Right? I've only otherwise read Ben Sinister and Panine, which are the books that happen on either side sure. of Lolita, and I think are also quite obsessed with academia and men in academia. But Ben Sinister is this nasty, mean-spirited, like political satire that I have to say I really loathed reading. And then Panine is just sort of maybe one of the nicest books of all time about an academic who's just having a wonderful life. Right. And it's just ep episodic and nice. And it's funny that this comes in between those, but that no one even would try to go for what he's doing outside of this because it's either too esoteric because general populace does yeah. not care about the lives of academics, nor should they. Right. Or it's like just nothing happens. Right. They're there's, just pro, they're just prose exercises. There's right. that movie, The Illusion Defense, which I've never seen. Oh, with John Turturro and Emily Watson. That is based on Weird. a book by Vlad himself. Okay, that I have read and liked. I never saw the movie. Mm -hmm. I heard it was boring. Yeah, yeah. He's one of those guys who it just feels very difficult to adapt because it really is about the language, and it's like if you lay out what's happening in the book, there aren't really the bones of uh, a, a dramatic story there. The Illusion Defense is also about chess, which is hard to yes. dramatize until, of course, Ani Taylor-Joy came along. Yeah, sure. Chess queen. Um, mm -hmm. That's a, a, a dumb Griffin-brained analogy, okay, right? Here we go. But there's that period where Stan Lee was just like, everything I'm fucking putting out to hit. Every time I have to create a new character, I'm going to fucking challenge myself to create the least appealing character possible. Where, uh, like, right. Iron Man was like a dare to himself. Mm. Where he was like, all the kids reading my books are like uh, uh, hippies. Like peace-loving liberal hippies who are into like hallucinogenics and shit. I'm going to write like a comic book about a like capitalist war profiteer. I'm going to make them fucking like this guy. Um, and Lolita was like that stage of Nabokov's career where he was just like, fuck it, I'm coming for you. I can yeah. fucking, I can win over the audience on anything. I mean, that's a cool artistic challenge for anyone regardless of medium. Right. I just think that it gets tricky in adaptation because then you're not the person who came up with this challenge. Of course. Therefore, you'll never have the inner workings of like why that challenge does or doesn't well, work. And the reason I bring up my analogy is that like, over time, he found like, oh, I was wrong. People actually just like Iron Man as a power fantasy. Sure, yeah. I didn't have to mm -hmm. sell them on this guy and his inner turmoil. They were just like, it'd be cool to have all the money and a robot suit. And then you get to a world where like Iron Man just rules our pop culture because everyone wishes they could just fucking be Iron Man. But you yeah. can't do He's that so with quippy. Humbert Humbert. No. You can't just be like, let's just give into the fucking power fantasy. We all obviously want to be Humbert Humbert. <laughs> That's a silly name he's got. It's the same name twice. It's one of the silliest what? names. What's going on there? What's his name? My name is Mr. Humbert, and I have a kid. Humbert. I'm like, well, we can't call him Humbert, obviously. <laughs> That'd be weird. <laughs> let's <laughs> immediately cross one name off the right. list. <laughs> <laughs> let's just... <laughs> It feels like that meme image of that woman crossing off the names on the top. Oh, Ash, Ashlyn and Ka Kaylee, but it's all yeah, spelled yeah, like yeah. it's a, yes, But then the last one is Humbert. Have you seen that? No. Meme? It's sort I'm going to find it for you. Old okay. meme. Classic meme. Yeah. Remember how good the chess show was? Sorry. I haven't let it go. Uh, uh, Queen's Gambit? Yeah. I never Queen, watched it. Queen's Gambit, and I think you and I would agree on this, and The Bear. Two, two great shows where yeah, not a lot of episodes. Yell about. Right. Watched them all in two and a half days. Mm. Time of my life. Those are two of my favorite TV shows of what I consider the current era the of TV. Me the too. Dog me shit too. Era. Sure. Right. You know, but there I was think, the golden age. Yeah. It ended. We're in the dog shit age. Meanwhile, <laughs> we were talking right before record. Uh, producer Ben, I was telling him about oh, recent yeah, he's season. Mean Kevin's. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Main Kevin Masters fucking rules. Well, Ben's watching no, Main Kevin Masters. And I was talking about good late season eight episodes of Night Court. Yeah, and Ben was like, how do you fucking have the time to watch all these old sitcoms and keep up? And I was like, the answer is I don't keep up. Yeah, you've never, never watched you've Queen's never Gambit, never watched an episode of The Bear. Oh, that's fun. It's funny. Yeah, it's a good meme. Yeah, yeah I just, I just uh, if, if there's discourse around a show, I'm like, maybe I'll watch that in 10 years when no one's arguing over it. She's also like barely pregnant. It's such a weird photo. Oh, it's so funny. What's the backstory on this? She posted this being like, I selected my baby name and she had written four unintelligible names and selected a fifth <laughs> so unintelligible So they're Taylee, <laughs> McCarty. 
Navy. Navy, Maylee, and then she ended up at Lackland. It's just one of those classic. La- Lakin, I think Lakin. 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 <laughs> Lakin. But just Lakin. one of those things. She's just like, you know, we all think we want to call our kid McCarty too. <laughs> you know, like, it's just like, we were like, what, what, what right. are you talking about? Right, because then she'll be like McCarty O in her class. <laughs> right, exactly. Two McCarty. Four of them in the yeah. fucking daycare. Every, you know, the teachers will be McCarty and yeah. <laughs> a bunch of kids will swarm her. Were there other Davids in your class? Did you have to be a David S? Only in the second grade yeah. I, was I David S. There was one other David. David was not a very popular name when I was a kid. I think yeah. it's maybe had a bit of a rebound. Well, because of this show. There was never another Griffin. But <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> What? Baby Nameless came out. David Griffin and Ben are the top three boy names? The hell? Fran's number one Producer. on the girls. Oh. is one of the top <laughs> names right now. Ben Deucer. Yeah. Poet <laughs> Laureate. Laureate. That's not a name. <laughs> no, it was like post-Twilight when like Jacob and Edward were the top two names for three years. Sure. Can someone make a meme of me in front of the chalkboard and then <laughs> there's like all my nicknames, that, please? Someone yeah. do that, please. Yeah. please Thank you. That. David, hey, smile for me. No, it felt fake. Oh, that looked forced to you? It looked forced. It looked a little forced. I'm trying to think, what's a sound that will naturally make you smile? Uh, you're going to have to tell me. Cha-ching! Uh, I do oh. love. Tell me what that noise is. A Cheshire grin went from ear to ear. It's the sound of another sale on Shopify, David. Uh, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Yes, they're, you know, they're very good. They give entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses. Yes. Fat cats on Wall Street and such. Right. No. Uh, upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Right. And now you, the power goes back to us small cats on... Undisclosed Street. You got to take the power back. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying blank check yeah. uses Shopify. We have our own Shopify. Yeah, what's the opposite of Wall Street? Door Street? I don't know. <laughs> Window Floor Street. Street. Window Street. You think window is the opposite of wall? I think they work hand in hand. It. I, say, I, think it's, <laughs> I think it's Floor Street. All right, fair enough, fair enough. It's fine. Us. Sky Street? No, we're getting too heady here. Yeah. Okay. Us slim dogs on Floor Sidewalk have our own Shopify page, and that's the power of Shopify. Look, it's a good website. Uh, we use it to sell our merch. We do. You can check it out, actually. We'd we do. like you to. And we got some new merch that's going to be coming at the end of the year, along with restocking some of your old favorites, um, comedy point coins and such. But David, what do we like about Shopify? Well, what do I like about Shopify? I mean, it powers millions of businesses, but you can synchronize online and in-person sales. You can reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps like Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Pinterest. Pinterest. Should we have a Pinterest page? Yeah, probably. It has the tools and resources that make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. You gain insights as you grow. Detailed reports. <laughs> Go to Shopify.com slash check. All lowercase. All lowercase. For a free 14-day trial to get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your businesses with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash check right now. Shopify.com slash check. A free Fortnite. Lolita. Lolita. Is a 1955 novel written by Russian-American novelist Vladimir Nabokov. Mm -hmm. Nabokov? Nabokov. Nabokov, Nabokov. I'm bad I'm pretty sure. I was corrected by someone who's who's read the sweep of them. So Nabokov. 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 Okay. Nabokov. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anything. It's that middle syllable that gets the punch, but you can do whatever you want with it, you know? It was one of those classic books that came out, and everyone decided it was totally good and fine. Mm-hmm. And what year did it, did it come well, out, 1955. David? Okay. No one no. ever thought about it. Uh, it came out. It was, it was turned down by almost every major publisher, uh-huh. right? It was published in France first. Yeah. Classic. By, you know... Whatever. Hell surprise, as they say. Exactly. Over there. Much like this episode turned down by almost every potential guest before Fran came in for the save. I'm 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 one of the braver people. Truly. To, to it wasn't a thing a where podcast. people were like, it wasn't like David Nevin, for example, where it's like you can't be in that movie. We'll talk about the you know, the people you know, Olivier, the people who turned down the, right. Mm-hmm. It was more just people being like, Well, I'd rather not. Right. Like, you know, anyway. No, they're afraid. Uh they're, they're afraid. cowards. They're it afraid was, I'm brave. It was put. You are brave. Um, you're in your brave era. I'm in my brave era. Yeah. We we talk about Fran's brave era all the time. That means she's watching horror movies. Yeah, uh-huh. I've started watching you're watching brave. horror movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was published in France by Olympia Press, most mm-hmm. a, a publisher mostly of quote unquote pornographic trash. Okay. Um, 
And it had this reputation almost immediately. Graham Greene immediately called it one of the best books of the year. It got like early raves. Oh, you don't like Graham? No, I have no. No, I think that's a, a crazy shot to shoot. Exactly. And he shot it. He shot it. Yeah. He was in his brave there. Yeah, I mean, truly. And then it, it was the classic thing of not only was it literarily well regarded quickly, mm-hmm. but because it was so controversial, that only fueled interest. Like, you have to read it to have an People opinion. were banning it and people were like running to, you know, get Do ahead remember, of every ban. Remember that period where if something was controversial, people would actually take the time to read it before having an opinion? Well, I don't know if that's true. I think a lot of people were not reading Lolita. Okay, that was enough. the whole thing. Sure. It's not a particularly purient, prurient book in its content. It's no. all... The yeah. idea is... There's nothing explicit really described in the book. It's, you know, it's, it's not a... Well, I was going to say, I have the opposite reaction to hearing something like that, where when I hear something's the best book of the year, I'm like, who cares? Sure. Who cares? I want to read some, want something that someone was a little more equivocal on, because that's maybe more compelling. But that's oh, something sure. that I think is legitimately a great book got that kind of early praise that I think that's it's worthy of is yeah. like, oh, okay. Especially because it was a, a edgy position for someone to stake their credibility on. Totally. Right. Yeah. There's so much that's been written and said about the book, the movies as well, but especially the book. Mm-hmm. And I do recommend Jamie Loftus's recent podcast about it. There's a lot of other yes. stuff like that. You can dig into that. It's too much. It's too much. I'm not going to give you all the context on the book. I will tell you about Stanley Kubrick, though. Please. He was covered tra- some of this in our Spartacus episode because right. he was really, this was his obsession for about five years. Um, but also he was long working during that sort of era on One-Eyed Jacks, which right. is the movie that Marlon Brando, a Western that Marlon Brando eventually just directed himself. Uh, and he exits One-Eyed Jacks and announces, because he must exit in a statement mm-hmm. because... Mr. Brando, et cetera, know that I want to commence work on Lolita. Um, and whether or not that's true, like, I think they also exited just because sure. Brando had a lot of clashes, but, you know, that was it. He announced, like, I'm leaving to do Lolita. He's also got this five-picture deal with Kirk Douglas, two movies, well, end he- up getting done before Kirk Douglas releases him. Right. And it's largely because Kirk Douglas is like, I don't want anything to do with this movie. Right, I don't want to do I'm not going to play Humber. I don't want to produce it. God be with you, but like I'm not getting near this thing. Um, this is all happening in 1958. That's when he quits One Eyed Jackson. That's when Lolita becomes a bestseller in America. Mm-hmm. It reaches our shores, and unlike in Britain where it was banned, it just becomes a big hit. Sure. Swifty Lazar, a famed old yes. Hollywood manager agent type, yeah, right? One Producer. of the greatest names in history. Pretty cool name. Uh, owned the screen rights, and basically says you're going to have to give me 150 grand even to start work on this movie. Like okay. he, he's charging an entry fee. Yeah. Uh, they work out some kind of a deal with him. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and this is sort of Harris raising the money for Kubrick? Correct. Yeah. Uh, and Harris, who's the producer, obviously James Harris, um, has to sell his rights to the killing, I think back to United Artists oh, wow. to get the money to buy the rights to Lolita from Lazar. Wow. So he really is like putting his ass on the line. Yeah. Kubrick says, it's one of the great love stories of Lolita. Here, I'm going to give you some quotes. He points to a Lionel Trilling piece that called it the great, first great love story of the 20th century, using his, as his criteria the total shock and engagement with the lovers, which the lovers in all great love stories of the past have produced on the people around them. Uh, if you consider Romeo and Juliet, Anna Karenina, Madame Bovary, uh, the Red and the Black, they all had one thing in common, the element of the illicit, or at least what was considered illicit at the time, and in each case, it caused their complete alienation from society. By the 20th century, it's, an, it's difficult to, he's saying like, there's nothing that's illicit anymore, right? Uh, sure. So he says like, Lolita succeeds in this classic tradition by, you know, being so shocking. Yeah. And Nabokov is brilliant in withholding any, indi- any indication of the author's approval of the relationship. I, I, I'm reading this just because I think you need this context. I do think it's interesting how he articulates it. I may, you know, confuse people as well. I don't know. But uh-huh. I should read this, right? Yeah, it's, yes, it's yes, 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 kind of, oh, yes. Yeah. Kind of I context. love this line at the end that he says. Yeah. It isn't until the very end when Humbert sees her again four years later and she's no longer by any stretch of the definition and quote unquote nymphit. That the really genuine and selfless love he has for her is revealed. 
which is true in a way. Like that is what's yeah. so sort of crazy about the ending is you're like, oh, he's beyond whatever initial obsession we understand here. But it's also so sad and de- pathetic and depressing when he's like giving that speech at the end. Yeah. But that's but Kubrick is very compelled by that. Sure. Yeah. But I also I I mean I, this gets to maybe some of my core issues with the movie, where mm-hmm. I, I feel like a lot of that oversimplifies the dynamics of what's going on in this book, which I think are very often like four or five things going on in different directions at the same time. Right. And Kubrick seems to keep on just picking one and drawing um, very straight lines. I would agree with that. Because this is being called a comedy. That's, I mean, but it, it's almost like he's forced to make it a comedy because you can't make it anything else. The seller's yeah, stuff that's, is that's, outright comedic. Yeah, I think right. it really has to be funny because if you think too hard about what is going on, it's too sad and too horrible. Yes. Right. And, and you're sort not of also my able, note with old. You're not going to be able to really talk about anything. I mean, that, that's the other thing. So you, Fran, you brought your big lolly. You went to see this movie at Film Forum. <laughs> yeah, I brought my giant lollipop to the Film Forum. Anyone wants to know what that's in reference to, just Google Fran Hoffner lollipop. Well, yeah, no, so we're going to no. talk about the lolly a lot more. Yeah, we sure. can talk we can about the lolly. lolly. I brought my lollipop. I ate the lollipop maybe for the first 40, 45 minutes, and then I got sick of it. And for those who don't know, and I once again implore you, look up the article, look up the photo. But Fran's talking about a classic giant skull-shaped sized not skull shaped, but skull sized, giant inch. Yeah, swirly yeah, yeah. pinwheel lolly. Yeah, that I sort of in bad faith pitched to work that I was going to eat one and write about it, and then Your, they were like, "You right. should do that." Your take was this is sort of seen as the ultimate candy, and no one eats them. Who actually has ever gotten a giant lolly? Yeah, and then there's some, you know, some stipulations were put into place that kind of like as a as a health class taking care of a fake baby, sure. I also could just not go anywhere in public without the lollipop. I didn't have to be eating it, but I always had to have it on my person. Yes. And because the lollipop is so big, it's not a lollipop that could just be put in my mouth and left there. I had to hold it. Right. (laughs) So it was easiest to do when I was not doing anything, e.g. watching a movie. Yes. Great opportunity to just put some time in on the lollipop, which is what I did for the first chunk of Lolita. Yeah. A two and a half hour movie. A two and a half hour movie. First 45 minutes. Laughter with my friends and peers and loved ones around me Mm -hmm. in part because lollipop at that point in time, though nearing its end too big still to fit in my mouth, (laughs) kind of just glommed onto it. Uh, (laughs) Just a horrible experience. Yeah. Humiliating, non-sexual. Someone's at the door. I think there's an ad read coming. (laughs) Oh, geez. Yeah. I better check. Oh, who's at the door? This is real. We should, I mean, it's, I feel like it's been a sad one, but this is actually, sometimes we do this and it's like a bit. I'll admit. I'll pull no, back yeah. the curtain. It's this time bit. it's real. I, I, I gotta go get the door. Okay. Who's here? Creek. How can I help you? Hi. Hello. What, what are you, what's up? You're in my home. Yeah, I'm a Brooklyn delivery man. Oh, sure. Uh, okay. You here to drop off Brooklyn? In? Yeah, what is this? It's just a... Oh, this is a podcast and we're actually frequently sponsored by Brooklyn. In. Oh, wow. You guys have a, like a promo code or something? Yeah, maybe I don't know. Maybe Nelly did order some stuff. I didn't personally. Your girlfriend is that yeah. your girlfriend? Yeah, that's humble brag. Wow. Uh, but I all right. You can just leave it uh, here. I'll I'll sign whatever. Yeah, I'll take this off. I mean, your hands. You want me to walk it into the room? Is that what you're? I'm not usually on mic when I deliver. Like this is you understand this is like a weird dynamic. Well, I can't have you talking off mic. Okay. Well, listen. Can I just talk to you for a second? Sure, all this is very unconventional. Just, I want to make it clear. That's okay. fine. Okay. Can I just say something to you? I like your energy. Sure, let's see where this goes. The weather may be cooling down, but Brooklyn Inn's Labor Day sale is coming to heat things up. Brooklyn Inn is kicking off their Labor Day sale this week with big savings on their award-winning bed, bedding and towel bundles. Yeah, I know. I know. I work for Brooklyn. I'm a Brooklyn right, Inn so you know that this week, every Brooklyn Inn product is on sale. Luxurious seats. Sheets, not seats. No Luxurious sheets. sheets. Sure. Plush towels. Cloud-like pillows. Can you confirm? Cloud-like? Yeah, I, I can convert. Are it's they like, so easy to uh, transport? Just pick up a cloud. Throw it up. It's like taking a nap on a Nimbus. Throw blankets and more. And we can't think of a better time to stock up on soft, cozy home goods before the temperature drops. Okay. So if you've been waiting to splurge on big ticket items like their heavenly weighted comforter or insanely soft linen sheets, Brooklyn's Labor Day sale is the perfect opportunity to save big, but only for a limited time. I don't mean to be rude. I just don't understand why you're saying this to me. I work for Brooklyn. I know... 
he clearly, I mean, I guess you didn't order Brooklyn. Can you, like, tell me the name of your maybe bosses? Richard Vicky Fulop, of Right, course. and like yeah. how many five-star reviews do you think the company's gotten over the years? Like, like a thousand? A hundred thousand, actually. Okay, well. Maybe you've gotten a thousand personally. Yeah, I think I'm pretty good at my job. Yeah, Usually, job. I mean, it's just I walk in, I hand the thing over to the person I leave. It usually doesn't involve someone explaining the company I work for to me. Is this what you guys do every time? Like, if someone rings the doorbell... When you're recording an episode, you just let them in, and they just sort of become a the lot thing. Of people for have barged in here over the years. Yeah. Right? Really, there's a precedent of yeah, this. Mr. Candyman. You know Dan Candyman. Yeah, well, I know Dan Candyman, okay. of course. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, he's uh, delivery. Know, I mean, Rhombus. He's one of the best. Who? You don't know Rhombus? <laughs> this is weird. Yeah. Wait, well, so, so am I like? Should I be doing more now? I'm realizing this is kind of like a. I mean, a this was kind of your shot. This I mean, I don't position. know if you have any talents. Yeah, you, you, you could have showed you want to plug or something. Oh yeah. No, I, that's not really. But I, I just, I, I, I have no background in that. Uh, it does feel like I should make the most of this. Um, me, 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 me. Uh, what was that? I was feeling like maybe I should sing, but then I don't know. You guys are looking at me like. No, I almost, I almost just thought you were like, like there was something on the air. Me, 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 me. Like there was some sort of. Oh, like a, a like a, a radio tower pinging. Like beep, 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 yeah, but beep, we're not beep, doing beep. that. Okay, look, let me give you the let okay. me give you a call to act. Sorry, I just say I'm not usually put on the spot like this. You understand? I didn't realize this was like a talent showcase. Anyone who comes to your door, Jeff. You wow, wow, brutal. Don't forget to head over to Brooklyn Inn today to save on high quality home essentials this Labor Day weekend. Can't wait to save. Visit BrooklynInn.com today and use promo code blank for twenty dollars off, plus free shipping on your purchase of a hundred dollars or more. That's B R O O K L I N E N dot com promo code blank. And by the way, my name is Jeff Brooks. Lennon. Wonderful. I I saw this at Film Forum as well. I went to different screens on different days. The Film Forum at the time of recording this has been doing this 63, 64, 65 series, 62. 62 63 64, because it's also with Jewish Museum and right. Film at Lincoln Center. Right. It's cool. It's cool. I mean, they played sure. Strange Love as well the day after we recorded our episode, which was annoying. Mm. But it was nice that I got to see this on a big screen. This I, is a good yes. one to be locked in the room. Absolutely. With. And I, look, I will say, like, at the time Just we're recording one, this, One's attention wanders watching Barry this Lyndon's playing, like, a week from now in wow. the city, and Ben yeah. and I are going to see that. I'm so No better experience than seeing that movie on the I hate screen. watching these Kubrick movies at home. Yeah. For so many reasons, yeah, uh, yeah. and I, I'm just excited anytime one of these screenings lines up where I can like just get ahead of it, see in a theater, get my full attention, and then right. lock it in my brain. Well, I saw Kubrick. He did Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, right? I saw he did. that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He came back for that one. Um, <laughs> he rose from the grave. <laughs> yeah, rose from the grave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's going to Paris in this economy. Um, I mean, that's an old book. He could have. It is an old book. He, he might. Maybe he read it. He might have we'll read it and know. been like passed. But the book is called like, oh, Mrs. Harris, oh, yeah. God, now she's in Paris. And it's, it's even more silly. Sounding. Isn't it literally It's apostrophe A. I was going to say, it's it, Mrs. Harris. Mrs. Harris goes to Paris. Yeah, right. But right, she does right. so much. She becomes like an MP or something. Oh, well, like yeah, their sequels? The I was not going to give it all away. No, I just, yeah, there's like five or six of them. Right, yeah, franchise, yeah. franchise. Okay, yeah, franchise, franchise. Hello, she's Disney. Doing well. She's up to 10 mil domestic. Is she doing, is she a 10 mil? I That's pretty good. And I'm sure that movie is cleaning up, you know, in Britain, you know, those yeah. movies do. I'm I'm saying Tamil domestic Britain. That's just great. Britain, it's been number one for a month. You know. Yeah. Uh, Britain is it's it's the Top Gun Maverick. You haven't seen it. No, I need you to. You know see who's it. so handsome Wait, you in it? Gone to, what the know, fuck is I the know, matter with I know. you? And I've seen some other bullshit. Lately. Exactly. You know yeah. who's so hot in it? Who? Jason Isaac. He is very hot. Fuck. He's playing like a working class bookie too. He's like, oh, Gavna. Oh, you don't oh, want to action. It's crazy. I love this era of Jason Isaac so much. It is a good era of Jason Isaac. And okay. there's not really a bad era of Jason Isaac, but uh, it is a good era. What? Um, Why haven't you seen that? I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm fucking up my life. You're texting me being like, I got to see a movie tonight, but it's between, you know, a love song. And, and Minions like, Rise of Minions. Minions. And like, I'm like, what's going on here? location stuff keeps on fucking me up. I feel like I'm also vaguely waiting to see Mrs. Harris with Rom, because that feels like such a Rom movie. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I mean, you know, she's not going to be My in sister. Paris forever. I know, I know. <laughs> I know, it's still playing. The clock I'm, is ticking. I'm going to go see it this weekend. It's my, it's my Wait, highest I priority run a, movie. You haven't right. seen Bullet Train yet. No. Well, you, don't, you're, honey, you don't did, bother. You did see League of Super Pets. I did. You've seen Nope. I saw it in 40X. I saw Nope twice. 
you haven't seen Thor Love and Thunder. No. You seen Open IMAX? Yeah. Worth rips. I got it. So good. I got it. Maybe I'll Inc- do like I mean, I saw it at like the AMC Empire IMAX, but I haven't seen it in the like the, the big old Lincoln Center. The aspect ratio changes are big on that movie. Um, cool. yeah. you've, have you seen? You've seen Top Gun Maverick. Has, has Gru yeah. risen for you? No, you've never yeah. seen any of them. I've never right. seen any of them. Did the crawdads sing? For they you? haven't. I haven't. I've yet to hear their song. <laughs> They're, they remain silent. They remain silent. Uh, Easter, I await their siren call. You didn't go to Easter Sunday dinner. No. Uh, you've seen Elvis. I have. You answered the black phone. I did. <laughs> you went to Jurassic World's Dominion. I, I did. Know. Yeah. You refused to see Vengeance. On principle. Yes. Mrs. Harris, you've not gone to Paris. My most sensitive movie this summer. But you did strap on the shoes for Marcel. I did. You know the best part of Black Phone is when he's so sick of that Black Phone radio and he's picking it up and he's going, what? Yeah. So funny. More dead kids? Yeah. Another one? Resurrection? No, I need to see Check that out. You love Becca Hall. No, I know. Uh, Resurrection, Uh, Mrs. Harris, top my list. And the director's a blankie of Resurrection. Um, But uh, only last, love song, what did you think of it? Not a fan. Yeah. I mean, look. Am I brave enough for resurrection? I'm yes. curious. Yes. Okay. Kind of brave yeah. era. It's mostly. Well, yeah. But what are you brave enough for? I don't know. Vengeance. That's a good question. I'm not brave enough for that. Yeah, I'm not brave enough yeah. for that one. What is that? It's the BJ Novak podcaster in Texas oh. movie. <laughs> no I mean, that's that a one. title of a movie that could be about literally anything, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. funny that that's what it's called. Uh, it should be called like Marcel the Shells with Shoes on. Here's what I was going to say. I've also been seeing a fair amount of rep screenings like Lolita to bring things back. Fair enough. I've been checking out rep screenings when I can. I'm okay. just trying to get in there and see the shit. The rep stuff is great this summer. Yeah, there's I been good say. rep shit I saw this Heat summer. at IFC. Oh, baby. Heat, remember that movie? People should see it. It's the 4K, you know, rest of the It's Escape of the Heat. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Over. yeah, exactly. Well, that was up to Nick Lachey weather. They, they should re- rename the it air conditioning. This That's is what they should call this it. This is now. what happened though at up to Nick Film Forum weather. Lolita. Just to bring it back. Yeah, yeah. this is what I'm going to talk about. I got too cold. Uh, well, the, the classic thing where you're not going to bring a sweater. It's hot outside, but it then you're in the so theater and it's that day, And I got yeah. so cold. I got to remember. Pack, I was packing a thing sweater into the bag. Uh, also, long ass movie. But this is what I was going to say. I don't know what your experience was like. Maybe that lolly was like messing with your nervous system. It definitely it 100, I haven't recovered. <laughs> it's an Arctic mint lolly too, right? Oh God, I wish. Um, I don't know how much your uh, lolly changed the, the sort of temperature of the theater. Uh, not literally, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the 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 uh, group psychology of the theater. But it's very interesting watching that movie in a room with other people now. Uh, I'm sure it was interesting to watch at the time. Sure. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying, but it's like, especially now where I think we're living Were people in a, laughing? Sometimes. Peter Sellers. Other times not. And other times going like, am I supposed to be laughing at this or not? Mm. Like it just, you could feel like the weird tension. And there were, I could feel there people who are just like, reverence, Kubrick, masterpiece, obviously. And there are people who are looking at this like a cursed object. And there are people who are just like, I don't fucking know what to make of this. And my experience watching the movie was I started to feel like I was hallucinating because the more the film starts having to do its sort of like haze code runarounds to not say the thing that's happening, the more I started to see it as like, oh, this feels like The Lobster. This feels like a movie with some weirdly agreed upon bizarre reality where you people just say insane things and nod to each other and then move on without explaining them. That's a funny comparison to make. Like and, then, and an apt one, I think, too. That's what it felt like to me. Yeah. You know, when I watched this when I was in high school and loved the book, I was just like, well, this doesn't get at what I like about the book. I find this movie boring in a slog. Mm. And this time I found it, like, truly bizarre. Mm. Mm. And, and I think part yeah. of that is the weird tonal, like, how much of it is pitched as a comedy. But then how much it's not even like subtext, it's sort of like they're, they're trying to circumvent the text of the thing. They're not burying it. They're like traffic cones that they're trying to weave between. Yeah. It's just, you know, you think of like, there's, Humbert is kind of his own antagonist right. in this film. But once the film loses Shelley Winters. Yes. The threat of sellers is really not that material. Right. For quite a while. For yeah. quite a, for both quite a while and in general, he's too zany. He's, I think to right. be perceived as like, and also you know he's going to get shot, and you know, right, and you already you know, know. It's ending. no, it just it starts to lose steam the second. I agree. Shelley Winters is kind of out is out of the picture. I think there's another problem, arguably. What's that? Which is, 
I don't know if this is just a modern perspective thing. Like, haven't seen this movie since I was like 15, forgotten most of how the movie plays out relative to the book, whatever. I'm watching it and going, are all these guys supposed to be quilty? Because I know Peter Sellers is playing all of them, but also, what does Peter Sellers do? Play four characters in a movie. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Where, like, when you get to, like, the cop scene is so bizarre. Where you're like, the tonal reality of this, where you're like, why is he suddenly affecting a new persona? And the persona is so specific. Mm -hmm. It's so odd. Yeah. And then when the next time he shows up, he's got like a fucking bald cap. And yeah. I'm like, so what, he's got Rick Baker like fucking coming, giving him looks now? He's fucking going to Harvey Firestein, his, his, his brother, to give him the fucking makeover? Now, wait a second. I just think this Claire Quilty character. <laughs> That's from later in time. <laughs> Is Excuse me. As played by Fire Sellers. He should be in this movie, and he should go like, what He's do you need from me now? Claire, we're going to make you a star. Sorry. Whoop. He's supposed to be a TV writer, or is he a movie writer, or just He's a, a screenwriter? He's a, He's a playwright a writer, who's sort right. of cashed in on TV, I think. He has big TV writer vibes, parentheses derogatory right. to I, me. I think um, he was sort of like an edgy day. playwright who crossed over into right, TV. Right, right. He's, He's getting the bag. But he's yeah. famous enough that he's like a cigarette spokesperson. Yeah, but you know, back then... Yeah. Celebrities so or whatever. Regional. It's also just odd relative to the book how much this movie makes him like an important cultural figure. Like this guy's oh, so just fucking a whole hip. thing. Yeah. yeah. Sellers is so crazy. I was rewatching when he shows up in Get Back. Well, he yeah. had kind of a relationship with the Beatles in general, yeah. but that sequence of Get Back is so as unnerving as any time he shows up he's, in Lolita. Because he just Peter has Sellers such... is profoundly disturbing. No, yes. I know. As much as I think he's so funny, like the idea of him in reality, you're like, God, was this guy just the weirdest fucking guy? Like, he's handsome though in this. Yeah. No, he's, 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 he's a, a handsome like, guy. I, he's, I like his smile. He's got a he's good very smile. Guy. Like, an interesting the, smile. The other, I mean, I like teeth like that. Yeah. You like teeth like that. Mm, he likes Sellers' teeth. The whole Sellers thing that he always said is like, there, there's no one there. But what's his famous quote where but he's you, like... You see that in Get Back, where they're yeah. trying to, like, riff with him, and he's giving them nothing. He just, sure. like, doesn't exist other than him being able to affect characters. Yeah, if he's in character, then he can do something, right? And all his, like, wives and lovers and friends all said the same thing, where they were just like, there's just nothing. I think fully Border dissociating. Yeah, yeah. Bordering on, like, sociopathic, where it's like... Like, it, it, I, there's the line I'm forgetting, but there was a, kind of famously... I say famously, because it's the fucking... Of course, the anecdote that I'm going to lam on to the most. Uh, but when he hosted The Muppet Show, he was like, the only thing I refused to do, because they'd always like have a guest host on and they'd be like, are you comfortable singing? Are you comfortable dancing? Do you want to do this? And he's like, the only thing I won't do is appear as myself. And The Muppet Show's whole structure was like backstage. Yeah. And then on stage, they're doing routines. Yeah. And he was like, backstage, I will be Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> backstage, I will play other characters. And they're like, well, there's a segment where like Kermit talks to the guests as themselves. He's like, that's not happening. I refuse to appear in like my neutral form because it doesn't exist. There's no one there. And watching the opening Claire Quilty scene, I do feel like, is this the closest he's ever come to playing, quote unquote, himself in a movie? Like there's something about the weird Claire Quilty who like doesn't know how to exist unless he's affecting another character. Yeah, he's doing like a greatest hits of himself. Right. Right, because the other scenes you're seeing him either be, like, unbearably uncomfortable or needing to hide in some other persona. And that opening scene, you're like, well, now he's just drunk and he's cycling through different bits right, and exactly. lines. Right, exactly. He's like a malfunctioning it. robot at the end. Yeah. Right, and you're like, this guy's kind of hip and cool and handsome and terrifying. And, like, funny and sad at the same time. Look, I got two things to say to you. Please. One, well, I'll continue the context in a second. Two... Ethan Cohen has cast Margaret Qualley and Geraldine Viswanathan in his new movie. Oh. What's the movie? I it's love like it. a lesbian road trip comedy set in the 90s that he co-wrote with his wife. Ethan Cohen. Wow. Just telling you. I love Geraldine. Me too. That's why I'm excited. She's love her. so good. It is so weird that they split up. Yep. Yeah. Joel is like, well, I'm going to do uh, Macbeth because, of course, I couldn't write something new without my brother. Hmm. He didn't quite put it that way. He was like, I feel, I don't know what I would do. Let like me. A, it was like a Francis project, though. That was part of yeah. it. Yeah. That's, that's how they pitched it. Like, All their Film collaborators Fest. were like, Ethan just doesn't want to do movies anymore. He's interested in plays. He's interested in writing fiction. Yeah. He doesn't want to do movies. And someday he'll come back to Joel. And now it's like, oh, Ethan quietly Ethan's making movies on his own? 
look, it's a you know, we were just talking about a lot, a lot of two friends, not friends anymore. What can we I tell you? We were saying in podcasting, most people Podcast. actually hate each other, and we're still friends. But the Fairleys broken up. Yeah, the Fairleys broke broken up. up. Yep. Sure. Oh. Each of the Fairleys have their own movie coming out this year. True. Yeah. No. Uh, no, Wachowski's brother. Fairleys, Coens, Hughes's have been broken up for a long time. Mm-hmm. There's another one. There's a fifth. Are the Nolans okay? Well, they, they've always sort of done They sort of thing. ebb and flow. I think they're yeah. okay. But they're I fine. Know, I think they're okay. Are they okay? How are the yeah. Dardens? Just kidding. They're still, they're still, yeah. they're still together. They're, they're holding down the fort. It's funny that they're brothers. Yeah. I guess right? so. Sure. And that they make those movies? They're really funny. <laughs> <laughs> those, and those movies are funny. They're funny. <laughs> <laughs> those movies are always they're some laugh of the riots. Movies. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what's funny about them being brothers, I think, is yeah. them making the most sort of grim shit of all time being like, and I'm doing it with my brother. Yeah. Right. And then turn to each other and being like, we, 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 yeah. uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, uh, steals a baby. Good. Yeah. Okay. Harrison Kubrick, speaking of the, all the adaptation stuff that you were sure. talking about, they ask Nabokov himself to write the screenplay. Nabokov mm-hmm. himself. Uh, they give him 75 grand. Oh boy. It's not take nothing. It. Nice work if you can get it. Exactly. Uh, and he is, of course, the sole credited screenwriter, but mm-hmm. they barely used his script. Right. Oh. Uh, they basically rewrote it on set, and even we're sort of like, don't even tell him what and we're he doing. Kind of just transcribed the book, right? Yes, I believe the script he uh, submitted was four hundred pages long, right. <laughs> which is too long. Yeah. <laughs> Famously in Hollywood, it's a minute a minute a page, and you that's too many minutes. What's insane about that is it sounds like he just kind of like reformatted the book. But he couldn't, like, this is an error where he you can't just copy draft. paste it. Right. Look, I mean, he like did eventually. To do yeah, that. but if, you know, if you got $75,000 to retype your book in Courier. Right, you'd, you pay you, someone else $5,000 to do that. Yeah, yeah. Hey, here's the do book. That. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I do believe he did finally submit a shorter draft. It's not like he literally sure. was just like, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> Catch. Right. <It's laughs> Think so, fast, Jimmy. The shorter draft is still, like. <laughs> Probably too long. Every script now that they talk about, though, and, like, do the trades, they're like, well. First draft was 350 pages. They love to say that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as Kubrick says, oh no, sorry, Harris says this, uh, you know, we weren't satisfied with the script. It was too long. Mm-hmm. We shot ourselves in a room for a month and rewrote it scene by scene. Uh, and then, you know, Sellers comes in and he's improvising on set. Right. And so a lot of that is just Sellers, which yeah. is going to be the same with Strange Love. Right. That Kubrick's like, Good, good. Yes, we'll integrate all of this or whatever. But the, you know. the retro writing where he would like take sellers' right. improvs and, and then pick the, the right ones and go like that's now part of the script. Yeah. Uh, and Nabokov says about twenty percent of his screenplay is on screen, but he is the only credited screenwriter, and he sure. did get an Oscar nomination. The film's only right. Oscar wow. nomination. Yeah. I always think Sue Lyon got the nomination, but she only got the Golden Globe. Yes, the film got lots of Golden Globe nominations. Right. Uh, it got. Nominated for James Mason, Shelley Winters, Peter Sellers, Best Director, and Sue Lyon got the Most Promising Newcomer mm. nomination. And, then, and she I mean, won. She won that. Right. The Oscar, excuse me, giving the only Oscar nomination for the screenplay, even if it is nominating Nabokov. Right, which is probably why they did it. Wild, because the performance in this movie are good, and the, most of its issues exist on the scripting stage. I will say that say. it is an absolutely stacked, one of the most incredibly stacked best actor lineups I've ever seen. I'm more I, I, I'm, supporting like, I'm not categories, su- but yes. Yeah, supporting, yeah. No, I mean, not bad. Okay, give me, give me the four acting categories. All one. right, best actor. Yeah. The winner, of course, is Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird. Hmm. One of those where you're like, of course he won. It's an iconic screen performance. Right. One of the great heroes of American cinema. I believe AFI voted him the number one hero sure. of all time. Number two, and, and, and he beat Remember one of the... 100 years, 100 heroes. Yeah, the, right? They did do something like yeah. that, right? And then he like 50 villains or something. one of the most famous screen performances of all time, Peter O'Toole as Lawrence of Arabia. Right. And it's the whole thing where you're like, well, how did he not win? And then you're like, oh, he lost to Gregory Peck right. playing Atticus Finn. Right. So and there's one he, of those... And then he right. never gets it. And he never got he never, it. He never yeah. gets it. Uh, and but then he you could have, get it. At his peak, he could get it. Yeah. And oh. then you have... Jack Lemon in Days of Wine and Roses, which is like, low points. You, you know, get... Lemon Serious. Yes. That's a good performance. Yeah. You have Marcello Mastriani in um, Divorce Italian style. Oh, cool nomination. Very cool nomination. Yeah. And then you have Burt Lancaster in Birdman of Alcatraz, where you're like, that's the fifth, and that's a pretty famous performance from yeah, a, no, a I, I wouldn't have heavyweight actor. I Mason over any of them. I might not eat. I don't know. I have seen all those movies. I don't know. But then give me supporting actor and actress. Okay, so supporting actor, we're like, why is Sellers not here, right? 
Yes. All right. Best. It goes to Ed Begley, senior, of course, for Sweet Bird of Youth. Never seen that movie. Uh-huh. <laughs> Victor Buono for Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Kind of a cool nomination. Yeah. Telly Savalas for Birdman of Alcatraz. Sloppy Telly. Who loves you, baby? Sloppy Telly. Omar Sharif for Lawrence of Arabia. And then Terrence Stamp for Billy Bud, which is an crazy good performance. Yep. Young Terry Stamp. Yeah. Wow. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe you kick out fucking Savalas. I don't know. He might yeah. hit you. He's got these, like, ham hocks. Yeah, I, 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 good luck trying to kick him out. <laughs> You better have some hardy boots on you. Yeah. And then supporting actress Patty Duquins for The Miracle Worker, which okay. is category fraud. Sure. Classic category. She was the young. She played Helen Keller. So then Bancroft wins lead. Uh, correct. Right. Um, Mary Badham, who, of course, is Scout in another yes. category fraud. Uh, she's the little girl in To Kill a Mockingbird. Wow. She's really good, though. But, like, so Sue Lyon's, like pushed out by two other kids is fun. Funny. And Sue Lyon is the lead in yeah. Lolita, probably, right? I mean, yeah. like, you, uh, yeah. you know, kind of. Yeah. I'd probably put Shelly in supporting and yeah. Sue in lead if I was. I, was I think they're both kind of supporting. but And then Shirley Knight and Sweet Bird of Youth. I haven't seen Sweet Bird of Youth. That's sure. Paul Newman, Geraldine Payne. It's a good movie, I think. Yeah. Thelma Ritter and Birdman of Alcatraz, which was fucking cleaning up in the acting categories. Yeah. And then Lansbury and Manchurian Candidate, who should have won. Oh. Yeah, an incredible. Oh. It's, look, it was a good time for movies. It was a good time for movies. Oh, she's like, so good. You know, picture and director, yeah. David Lean's like, I'll have those. <laughs> <laughs> Only made the that fucking most incredible it. epic of all time. Enjoy it. Uh-huh. Bancroft, as he says, wins Best Actress. Right. And that's Betty Davis, Catherine Hepburn, Geraldine Page, Lee Renwick for Days of Wine and Roses. Like, that's, yeah. that's a, yeah. it's a good time. It's a good time. Horton, Horton Foot beat out fucking Nabokov for adapted screenplay. He did uh, To yeah, Kill a Mockingbird. A good win. Yeah, yeah. This is what I'm saying. Yeah. America had to kill Mockingbird fever. Mockingbird. <laughs> Mockingbird. Which I think they maybe still do, you know? Yeah. Sure. There's that weird sequel that came out. Yeah. Go, yeah, Ghost of the Watchmen. Fucking a bummer. Yeah. I mean, it was really funny. <laughs> I know it's kind of a bummer. But it was funny that they were like, she's releasing another book. And I was like, oh, my God, amazing. And they're like, and it's a Kill Mockingbird sequel. And people are like, holy shit. And then people are like, she probably never wanted to release. This is like weird exploitation of an old woman, right? And the, book's and the book about, comes like, out. My dad like, actually Atticus saw. Finch, what a... I was going to say a bad word. Yeah. <laughs> what an asshole. Yeah. Hmm. But that was like, I'm so racist. And right. I hate I hate everything that I did in the, the, the other one. <laughs> And then apparently it was the first book she wrote and then yes. she scrapped it. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they were like, I don't know, maybe Addicts Finch should be nice. And she was like, oh, good note. Oh, okay. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, most successful book ever. Great. Cool. Retired. See you later. Uh, pretty wild. It, the whole thing was yeah. wild. Uh, no, it, I mean, look, it, it's, it's the thing with this movie where it's like you have four performances that are all essentially different acting styles. <laughs> that are arguably in different films, but I think all four are pretty great. In this movie. Yeah. Now, I agree. W- w- when any two characters are interacting with each other on screen, you're like, what the fuck is going on here? Which movie am I supposed to be watching? That's and then when fair. you think about like some of the other characters, you're like, what would that dynamic be like and shit? I do think Shelley Winters kind of, Gets at that weird relationship. The I best. Do like too. then the two of them together, you do. She's so good. I, she's, she's my favorite incredible. performance that people tend and to shit so on. So plainly, right? well, because it's so big. It's so big, right? But I think there's but no other way to go. Is. That right. character is big, big in the book. You sort yeah. of hate her in the book because yeah. you do. she does You're feel like she's like annoying. Like yeah, I'm this, with you. Humpy. This antagonist or whatever, right, right. and I think the movie does a fair enough job. Um, empathizing with her yeah. while also like I just think the screenplay that exists as it is in the movie basically hates all four of these people but i do yes. think it hates the shelly winters character the least actually i think I, I, I think yes they view her as the only one who is sort of uh without sin yeah and her sin is you know the classic woman's sin of just being annoying yes. right, right but i don't know my friend tess is always like if shelly winters is in a movie it's not ending well for her no um, she plays a lot of tragic figures no, she's, she's so operatic so... in her suffering and her misery but like yeah. watching the Adrian Lyne version it's Melanie Griffith 
Oh, sure. Okay. And she's trying to It's like late sack. 90s Melanie Griffith. Okay. Right. She's just like, well, I know the Shelley Winters performance is infamous. Uh, so it's just really quiet. That's not how it should be. She no. should be loud and kind of annoying and right. kind of like declassé. Like the whole, like Humbert is just disgusted with her because he's like, I'm classier and smarter than this person. Right. And you're mm-hmm. like, you know what? Fucking relax, buddy. Right. It, it's the sort of, the lack of self-awareness on the character is the key to the whole thing. Yeah. And I think there's sort of a beauty in her lack of self-awareness, yes. too, that she brings to it. Or I but don't she know. she is the only person in the movie who's kind of not tortured. Mm. She's got a lot of self-doubt, but sure. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I feel, I feel for her pretty much immediately. Yeah. She's she so gets desperate to, to just have a move in. Yeah. She gets to have the sort of great character trope of being maybe the most morally sound but least put together but she but she's looking past the like the thing that's right in front of her sure and it like right from the beginning when he sees lolita and he's like i will move in actually my bags are in my car and she's like what was the what was it and he was like your pies and she's like oh and i'm like Come on, man. He just fucking saw your daughter sunbathing and he's like, oh, yeah. What, is this my room? No, this is the kitchen, Humbert. This was Stop not a, this was not a thing kitchen. that people had to be afraid of until this book. People what? never thought an adjunct could move to your house <laughs> and do this marry kind of shit and, yeah, and marry your daughter and, and kill you or whatever. It was sort of the reefer madness <laughs> kill of you with time a diary. in that way. It there was, was no sort of like, precedent. You need to know the silent, the silent killer. <laughs> Adjuncts? <laughs> the threat. <laughs> That looms. I guess he has tenure in Ohio. What is he, a speaker? He's just a speaker in their town? Don't you throw your academic language at me. I don't know how it works in the big universities, Francis. Oh my gosh. Maybe he's on residency. Okay, not all of us went to Kalamazoo and Rutgers. Oh my God. Claiming both. Yeah, are both Hornets and Scarlet Knights. Is it Hornets? The Humbert of Boise, Idaho. But I was not that. I was just a person who was in town renting a house. Is it Hornets? Yeah, you were like a... Are they Hornets? Kalamazoo is Hornets, and of course Rutgers is the the Knights. Scarlet Knights, yeah. Yeah, go Knights, go Hornets. Buzz Buzz, loyalty. Buzz Hornet. Sort of a crazy name for a mascot, Buzz Hornet. I'm now just imagining like a Rutgers game with like 90,000 fans, and it's like, who are these loud? Oh, that's the MFA program. (laughs) They'll call the MFA kids with like big foam fingers. I feel bad. (laughs) Big foam books. I feel bad I didn't see a Rutgers football game. You should Yeah, well, you could still go. You live in New York. They're They're using big foam fingers to read a big (laughs) program. And they got big foam they got glasses big foam on. Highlighters. <laughs> Highlighting. Um. Oh, we have fun. I should go back. To, yeah, yeah, go back to what's the stadium called? Rutgers Stadium? Oh, I just meant to Rutgers. But, yeah, you um, should get another degree. Yeah, why not? Uh, it's called the SHI Stadium. Boring. Um, okay. Sounds like the SHI. In stadium. the screenplay, of course, they bring Quilty's murder to the front, yes. as we said. Right. Kubrick's take uh, says the main, main problem with the book is, uh, and even with the film, is the main narrative interest initially boils down to Will Humbert get Lolita into bed. Right. And the second drop has a second and a half has a drop in narrative interest after that happens. Mm-hmm. We wanted to avoid this in the film. So if you have Quilty at the beginning, the audience can constantly, I guess, be wondering, like, how is it going to get to this? And what is Quilty up to? Right. I, I guess that's sort of like the, if you've not read the book, and you're seeing this movie like halfway and you're like, so how is you're probably just still like, how does this <laughs> link up to yeah. him murdering Peter Sellers in cold blood so mid bit? Fulty is so <laughs> inscrutable and these different yes. personas are so bizarre. Yeah. Yes. So initially it was at Warner Brothers. Uh-huh. They said you could have a million dollars if you pre- don't make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> if you leave this room we'll never with talk that about this. book, uh, if you like figure out censorship in advance, basically, I guess, like if you right. like work this out with the MPAA, um, uh, Kubrick gets in a big fight with them. They want final cut. They want control over everything. He quits. Uh, instead, they have to find a star to try and lure another studio sure. in. Kirk Douglas. Uh, was the move for Paz of Glory. Right. But uh, as you said, not interested. No, thank you. It would make no sense. Uh, no. Olivier, very, cl- the most obvious choice. Right. Uh, yes. His agents say, don't do it. Yeah. David Niven agrees to do it, but then is worried that it will lose the sponsorship for Four Star Playhouse, probably some TV show he was doing yep. or whatever. Yep. So he backs out. 
Brando was interested. Of course he but was. But it too complicated schedule yeah. wise, and he's Marlon Brando. He's probably just fucking annoying and weird. Wrong wrong type of guy, I think, in the way that Kirk Douglas also wrong type of guy. Yeah, I mean with Brando, you're just sort of like, look, I would see him do most things. Like yeah. Lord knows what that would look like, but it doesn't immediately seem right. Oh sure. Yeah, sure. No. Yeah. Olivier is the one where you're like, absolutely. I, that that would make sense. Yeah. Olivier is very good at playing very unlikable characters. Yes. I mean, uh, the, the, I mean you, especially just coming off of Spartacus and Kubrick getting that kind of performance out of him. There's something about Mason's teeth in this, though. I mean, not just in this, but Mason's teeth are kind of the element for me where I'm like, this is why you were the best star of this moment to play this. For how like suave and sophisticated you are and like sort of bizarrely handsome you can be, Every time he opens his mouth, there's something like a little shark-like to him. He's got that Michael Fassbender thing where when mm. he smiles, you're like, oh, you're like yeah. a little dangerous. Uh, I agree with that. Yeah. he's Look, I don't understand James Mason's career when I'm looking at it. No. Because he was a big theater actor who makes the leap to movies, mostly playing villains at first and stuff. Mm. And then, like, does Fox movies, but none of them are big hits. I guess he was in, like, a Prisoner of Zenda yeah. remake. But, like, and, like, and then it's, like, he's in A Star is Born. And you're just sort of, like, what in his career? Because, like, A Star is Born is such a plum role. Like, right. Cary Grant was the first choice or whatever. Yeah. And I just don't really get it. Like, I, not that he wasn't a good actor. I'm just, I don't get why he gets to be up against, up with Garland yeah. in like one of the biggest blockbusters of all time. You but read, that's the one. You read so often though in that And then era. he does 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea right. and it's sort of like, yeah. okay, this guy's set. Who is he in 20,000 Leagues again? Uh, he's um, Nemo. Is he Nemo? Yeah. Okay. I've yeah. seen that movie, but I just couldn't remember prior to my understanding He's of got him. one little arm and one big arm and, It's Bradley you know, Cooper who, um, it's a Finding Nemo. Who was reading Lolita to whatever girlfriend yes. in the park? To, uh, Suki? What's her name? Yeah, Snooky Water. Yeah. Snooky. Classic. So, it's it a reading into Snooky Water. It'd be funny, <laughs> it'd be funny if it was Snooky. Yeah. Um, it's going to be my Halloween costume this year, Snooky Waterhouse. So he comes in and. I, I was just going to say sorry to yeah, that about point. Jamie, Jimmy, Jimmy I feel M. like when I've dug into things like that, of like, how does that star suddenly get moved to a position and get on this big project or yeah. this person who had it's been a character actor movie. get the lead or whatever it is? And so often the answer is like weird studio system politicking where it was like someone else they had that they wanted was under contract to a different studio. At the last minute, they figured out they couldn't use them. And then they had someone who they needed to put in a movie that year. You know? Yeah. I don't know. No, you're probably right. It's like literally Wikipedia, which is Wikipedia right. too. But it's like, None of like it lists like five movies he did in the late forties, early fifties, and it yeah. says like none of them were successful. Right, and I'm just like, well, then, but whatever. Obviously, he's a compelling screen presence. Yes, I'm. That might literally be it. It's like, look, this guy's gonna figure it out. Yeah. Um, Kubrick says, handsome, vulnerable, easy to hurt, a romantic. He basically wants like this guy to feel heartfelt. I guess mm -hmm. on top of the monstrous. Easy to hurt's a good yeah identification. Yeah. Um. Lolita, they see a million people. Sue, you know, it's one of those, whatever. <laughs> Sue Lyon gets the part with the yeah. first audition. I, you know, I don't know. Like, it's what, kind of what you said about child acting at the time. Like, Kubrick says, like, she was very casual. She was cool. She wasn't giggly. She was enigmatic. And it's like everything you're saying is like how a grown up would behave. Right. And I guess that, of course, that makes sense that you want Lolita on screen to read as sophisticated. Yeah. But still. But she's got... I don't know. When you read that book, you have no sense of the character, of you, Lolita at other, all. I mean, it, and in this movie, you really do. It feels like Judy it's Garland the biggest to, difference me, to me. Where when okay. you watch, like, uh, Wizard of Oz, right? And Famous you're like, this movie. character's supposed to be, like, 12? Isn't Judy Garland, like, 27 in this movie? Yeah, but you know, 12 and then you year look olds it were, like, running LLCs back then. <laughs> yeah. This is my point. Then you look it up, and you're like, Judy Garland was 15 right. when he shot yeah, this? Yeah, she's like But she's, kid, like, yeah. so poised. Yeah. And the acting style is so specific. I don't know what friends I'm laughing at you saying famous movie. After oh, Wizard of Oz. Yeah, right. Yeah. This mm -hmm. feels like a very Judy Garland performance to me. Mm, and I, I I don't generally view that as a negative, but for this material, it creates such an odd vibe, especially when they've already aged the character up a little. I mean, the difference between 12 and 14 is pretty huge. The sure. other big difference they make in the script, obviously, is that everyone calls her Lolita. 
Yeah, they don't. Whereas they don't in the book, it. it is internally his pet name for her. Yeah. Right. That no one calls That's her Lily. Like in not the book. verbalized. Right. That creates such an odd. Reality. Well, they also completely remove his whole like. When I was a child, right. I had a crush on this girl, and then she died. You know, his whole like yeah, weird yeah, invented yeah. backstory, whether or right. not it's, you know, which the Adrian Line movie like front loads. Like that's right. the opening of the fucking film, right? right. That's the opening of the book, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but it I, do, it does create an odd effect for me where it's like, and and so much of it is just obviously Lolita is just shorthand for so many other fucking things now. Sure. But yeah. when you're in a movie where the character's name is Dolores and everyone's calling her Lolita. It feels like everyone's acknowledging, not that they want to fuck her, but this weird status she has for certain people. Totally. Does that make sense? Yeah. Rather than it being like, I have this name for her in my head that no one will ever hear. That's my secret language. And yeah. then that invented name becomes Yeah, no, it, this... it externalizes the entire conflict. Yes. Yeah. Um, Better way to say I it. I agree that she feels so fake in the book. You have no real, she doesn't feel real. To a point where you're like, this is someone this guy could have made up yeah, because right. he's insane. It feels hallucinatory. Right. And, and so she, she, re- she doesn't even talk much in the book. Like, you know, her like dialogue she's, is She's a much. child. Like, what does he talk to her about? He's right. just, he's a psychologically broken Flaubert. man. Yeah. yeah right. Right. Fucking the whole bovary. point is it's like his uncontrollable fixation. Yeah. But, but in the movie, she's like a character and she's like, you know, bickering with him and she's, yeah. you know, quite charming in those early scenes in her way. I don't, you know, like where, it, I don't know. It changes the whole tone of everything to me. Yes. That she's just like, you know, one of the four leads. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's certainly pitched more mature effective, effectively. It feels grounded. Right. It, that's, but that's, again, all of these but things are But it's like she's sort of the only one doing a grounded performance. Right. Yes. In the movie, I would say. Which I, I think yes. finally like pays off in the final Scenes. The ending like, is amazing. Right. She's great. Her, her final also, scene is amazing. Her final the best scene Mason is, like, is the best in the best part of the movie. movie. Yes, it is. Right. Yeah. Like that's when it works. Sue Lyon talks very fondly about Kubrick says Lolita could have been an embarrassing film for everyone, but he saw that it wasn't. But has also talked about how fucked up the production was that James Harris, who was like 32, supposedly seduced her on set when she was like 15. No 14, good, very 15. Bad. Don't do it. No good, very, very bad. Don't do it. Uh, this is like, it's all one way. Harris just was so old and didn't talk about it. This was all like reported on very recently, like yeah. a couple years ago. Yes. Um, and then you have Sellers, mm-hmm. who I guess Kubrick just thinks is funny. Yeah. Because it's not like Strange Love where you're like, okay, there's a pre existing connection now. It's like, it's not logical to cast Peter Sellers in this. Well, not entirely logical. The other insane thing, Fran. Is like that Lady strange love and Mouse Who gets Roared. made because the takeaway from this film is having Peter Sellers play multiple characters kind of made that thing a hit. That's the thing that audiences liked. If you could develop right. a new it's movie fair enough. around multiple Peter Sellers characters, you have a green light. I mean, I have to say, like, I've seen Strange Love too many times at this point to to where it's like not really an enjoyable experience for me anymore. Mm-hmm. But if you were like there's a different movie where Peter Sellers is playing a bunch of different characters and they're not the characters you saw in Strange Love. I'd be like, okay. That's the thing. Lots it's of kind of roared. odd that this is the one that creates that it, it isn't. model. It isn't. It, yeah. I mean, and when I, told, when I told people I was going to see oh, it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. The word. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, sure. When I told people I was going to see this, everyone was just like, Sellers being crazy. Sellers yeah. is crazy. And I, nothing to do with sort of. It's just weird that po- Sellers is doing it in Lolita. I remember reading the book hearing that Peter Sellers played Quilty, and I was like, oh, that's interesting casting. Absolutely. It's interesting casting to put Peter Sellers in a drama mm-hmm. and have them play this kind of inscrutable... It makes total sense, though. You're like, that. Right. I can see it. Like, right. And, and then they're like, yeah, but don't worry, he also kind of does like a German psychiatrist bit, and you're like, he does a what? That, <laughs> like, what, what, what does he do that? That's the thing you're not <laughs> expecting, is that Lolita turns into a Peter Sellers movie, not that Peter Sellers is in a Lolita film. Yeah. And it really does feel like, I mean, like if for Kubrick to basically outright say, look, the problem with the book, and let's be honest with my movie, is that halfway in, it kind of loses it. And right. you feel the movie be like, okay, hey, Peter, you want to do some stuff? Like, I don't know. We, we got time to fill here before he shoots you. Yeah. You want to do some stuff? Right? Yeah, but it also. Pick up the energy. It has that weird, like, uh, the nope thing. Where you're like, oh, like the biggest events are happening off screen and you're both telling us and not. The nope? This is, wait, what? what nope, is, the movie? 
What's this? Yeah, in nope? where you're like, oh, like Jupe in Nope is kind of the most important character. Sure, sure, sure. And all oh, these yeah, yeah, yeah. things are happening. It's him with just him. talking about. It. I mean, obviously, you see a little bit of it, but right, like right, yeah, but yeah. you like don't even him realize until the thing. end. Like, oh, that's been going on for the last forty minutes and all this shit. Right, 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 or right, like right. the scene at the end where she spells it out and she's like, "Here's what was going on in between every other scene that you just saw." Right. Where you just have these extended sellers conversations that are like the buffer for the things the movie's not going to show right. you or tell She's you. She's actually been seeing this guy the whole. And of course, that is the experience in the book because you're locked to his perspective. Right. Yeah. Is you're like as the reader, you're like she's slipping away from you. This, you know, what are you talking about? Like, and that's how you feel in the movie too. Oh, she's going to piano. She's not going to piano lessons. Like you know, but right. it's, but because it's in the book, it's again you're just so like lost, locked in with him. And such, and to me, it's kind of an awful experience reading the book. I really, it's such a well done book. It's like, well, yeah, but I was really like sick of this fucking guy. <laughs> like yes, halfway, yes. I was like, come on, you. Well, um, I always, in, and in the in, movie, you're you know you're leaving his perspective. And it's reading the book, the difference between Bolte and Humbert. Well, I don't know if you know this. His name is Humbert Humbert. Uh, One of those guys with his two first names. Right. It's the same one. Humbert feels like this. Like I, I am broken. I am caught in this like psychological prison of my trauma. I can only love nymphettes, and here is like the one I am most attached to, and I've just destroyed my entire life around, right? Mm -hmm. And Quilty just feels like, I mean, she even has the line where she's like, what does she say? That he's like so much more spiritual, or he's got a very Eastern philosophy on things. Some, yeah. Right. That Quilty just seems like a fucking libertine. Right. Who's just like, I do whatever the fuck I want. Yeah. You know? And that, like, Humbert's hatred of Quilty is so linked in this thing where it's like, he can my live, illicit love is real. He versus, can live openly as a freak, Quilty. Right. A freak in quotes right. here. Uh, whereas, obviously, Humbert can never speak of it. I get, I get that, yeah. I think Humbert thinks of himself as a Quilty up until he's sort of confronted with the idea of yes. Quilty. Right. He's like, I too am a free think thinking intellectual who mm. can pursue whatever and I'm not trapped by the limitations of society. But then when he meets a guy who actually kind of lives that way, he's like, I hate this guy so much. It's like everything's just a fucking lark and a goof for this guy. And I'm like Frankenstein's monster. Like I'm a lark and a goof. He's a sort of a randomista, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> he's definitely. Uh there's just so many. Is he kind of the original shit poster? Sure. Yes, he's a big shit. No, but it's just so many scenes where Mason's like, just stop this foolishness, you know, both yeah. to Lolita and Quilty. What, what are you talking about? Like right. all that, that kind of malfunctioning. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, though. The, the Mason what? playing I mean, like a universal monster. I mean, it's funny to watch him go monster. insane with it sellers. Is. It is. Those Mason scenes feel like universal monster shit where it's like the right. guy monologuing about his affliction mm. and how he wishes he could get over this dreaded wolfman curse, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Shelly Winters just to give you a little on her, sure. uh, was campaigning for JFK so hard that she demanded the movie be shot around that. She was like, you can't start filming until election, until inauguration okay. day. Okay, Slay. Yeah, yeah. And, and they were like, we have to start filming. So they started filming after election day, but they wrote in her contract that if he won, she could go to his inauguration, wow. which she did. Political yeah. Lady um, Gaga at Javits Center, you know. She did not get along with Stanley Kubrick at all. Not surprised um, to hear that. Hmm? Not surprised to hear that. Right. Very strong personality. Had her take. He struggled to mold her take, is my guess. I mean, we also watched the making of thing for Portrait of a Lady, her final film, where Jane Campion, who's a much more tender, empathetic filmmaker, yes. was just like, she just, every single take, she goes like, I can't do this, it's too painful. <laughs> right. Like, Shelley Winter's whole thing, oh, really? very connected to how her emotional sort of flood on screen at every moment was just like, don't make me do this, please. This is true. I can't. I can't. Uh, yes. According, I love her so much. Yeah. At one point, apparently, Stanley Kubrick almost fired her and said, I think that lady's going to have to go. That's the quote, the Stanley Kubrick quote. Uh, so <laughs> that's how annoying, because I think firing her from the movie would have been very complicated. I mean, the movie, the movie so does star that to her. at this time, arguably. I, I mean, think Mason's I guess, a bigger sure. star. But, but she's certainly a big name. Yeah. She's an Oscar winner already, yes. I think. Yes. Yes. And because so, uh, Diary of Anne Frank, that's her first yeah. win. So, yeah, I mean... Does she win for Poseidon? No. Nominated? No, she's nominated. nominated. That's her final... No, she wins for uh, Anne Frank and for yeah, Patch yeah. of Blue, the, the uh, Sydney Poitier movie. She's so good in fucking uh, Place in the Sun. Yes, she is. She's... 
awesome. That's I the love thing about Shelley her is you're like, she won two Oscars and then trying to guess which two she won Right, for. there's a lot of plausible. You're like, she could have won for five or six different films. Um, they shot it in England, as we noted. Every time oh, with these. you know, know I know that. that. Well, I read the dossier. Okay. Um, but like every time it's like Kubrick's like, yeah. it's before he's just like, I live in England now, bitch. Right. Don't ask questions. Right. In the 60s, he's like, he said, that's he just said a bitch. good idea. I don't know. There's a great deal on a studio over there. You know, but he keeps sending up there. What was yeah. Oh, I said he said bitch? When yeah, he you, said don't ask that? questions, bitch. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. They shoot it at Elstree. Um, I didn't know they shot this in England. They did? Okay. Of course uh, you wouldn't know that. You grew up in Chicago. He yep. did incredibly mm-hmm. long takes, like 10-minute takes. Uh-huh. Which I feel like is a thing in the early 60s. That's when Hitchcock's fucking with that the most, too. Sure. Where they're like, how long can we go? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and uh, he played music on set, classic silent film technique. Uh-huh. People still do it sometimes, right? Sure. Yeah. To set the mood, and uh, which sounds weird, but that's okay. And so they would play like West Side Story music to make Shelley Winters cry. I don't Aww. think you need to do anything to make Shelley Winters <laughs> cry. Apparently, she was into it. Irma LaDuce would apparently floor James Mason. Okay. And for Sue Lyon, they would play, they, he says, Terry, this is Terry Southern, not Elvis, but someone like Elvis to get her going. Sure. Some kind of balladeer, you know, okay. sort of. Mm. Yeah. The final sequence where Humbert finds Lolita and tries to mm-hmm. convince her, that took the longest. They shot that for like two weeks. Yeah. That's where they're like, we have to nail this. And I do think that is the most arresting part of the movie. Yeah. Beyond maybe some of the seller stuff where you're just like, what the fuck? The, the, I, I will say that is the only section of the movie that holistically works for me. Yes. Where I feel like the movie has complete control over its tone and its intent and its sure, interest. Sure, sure, sure. And then there are other scenes that I find fascinating, but they feel at odds with themselves. I mean, I think that's a yes. beautiful scene, which the movie really does not have very many of. No, it has right. a lot of compelling scenes, but not, yes. certainly not beautiful ones. The movie is mostly right, compelling in a horrifying way. Right. The, the yes. seller's porch hotel, pretending to be the cop scene, I'm like, is captivating. But what the yeah. fuck is this? And that whole sequence is kind of already alarming. Right. The also, whole what, like cot bed, you know, the whole like yeah, conversation with the shit. clerk where you're just like, I want It's weird how much of it, right. Like they, yes. Well, I was going to say, what's his sidekick? Peter uh, Seller's sidekick? Yeah. Oh, the woman with the her of, severe haircut. Like, right. Yeah, but like she keeps popping up in a way where I'm like, okay, so this is. She's sort of like the great gazoo, you know, only he can see her. Is she the great gazoo or is she Jelaine Maxwell? <laughs> well, she's going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 100%. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're very similar figures, obviously. Totally. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Trendy haircut. Yeah. yeah. There's also the whole weird thing with him being disgusted by the swinger couple. Right. In the town. But like again, it's, right. Like it's perverts and freaks. Want it's to. the, you know, I'm not like them like right. thing. Right. Yeah. I do love when he's in the bath, avoiding That's them. the scene I want to talk about. That is another scene where Go you're ahead. like, this is captivating. It is so strange. I don't know what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Talk well, so about he's it. He's found out that she's died. Yeah. Then he goes back to his bath. He's getting drunk. Yep. He's sort of relieved because he was terrified. He was going to get caught. He was going right. to get rumbled. Right. I think it's, a, it's, a posi- have... it, it's a positive bath for him. Absolutely. He maybe shouldn't have written all his crimes down in a diary for his wife right. to find, but yeah. And he's drunk with joy, but also sort of like psychologically unraveling because he's a madman. And then all yeah. these people are coming and, and not over. Not only that, but it's also like, wait, could I get away with it? Like right. the weird kind of like thrill of that. Right. Like, yeah, horrifying. Everyone's yes. coming over to console him, give him their like, uh, you know, morning fruitcakes or whatever. Ugh, love a morning fruitcake. And it's just like one by one, they all walk into this room like they're the fucking like fireman and cop from something about Mary checking out the dick in the zipper. Catching him in the bath and going like, oh, I'm sorry, should I, should I not be here? And he's like, no, come on in. <laughs> and everything he's doing is insane. And they're like, I don't know, I guess grief is weird. Yeah. I mean, I guess it is. Yeah. It's kind of similar to like the later stuff where in the hotel or whatever, where they're like, yeah, I guess he's her dad and this is what's right. going on. And he's sort of doing the like, oh, my wife's going to show up in a minute. Everyone's like, who am I to judge? I'm like, right. feel free to judge. Yeah, you know. 911, famous number. Call the police. <laughs> One of the if top phone numbers yeah, of all right. time. Yeah. Uh, or just ask some questions. I'd ask even one. But no one wants that. No, no one wants to. But that's part of, I think, the weird, like, the, the lobster-esque reality of this movie for me. 
where it's like, well, obviously they can't talk directly about what's really going on, but also the lack of interrogation by other people around them feels like you he can only ask questions about how many beds we need in a room. The right. movie has that bizarro world that the book doesn't have because you're so locked into his POV in the book. They're right. like, well, the world must be normal and he's insane. Right. Th- yes. But in the movie, you have that bizarro thing of like, well, if you've got little fuckers like sellers walking around, maybe right. James Mason actually seems normal. Yes. That yes. when he like can't remember if he's if he's with his wife or his girlfriend, you're just like that the weird guy. Here's the other thing the book get away with that uh, doesn't have to consider that the movie does because it's a visual medium. You have to watch people perceive him. Yeah. And perceive him with her and yeah. their behavior. Yeah. In the book, he's so solipsistic. He's so caught up in his world. He's yes. just telling you his internal life that you don't have to think about like every time they go to check in at a hotel. Right. They have to walk in together and have They're this like, whole He has to do his little cot song and dance. <laughs> and then she's like <laughs> sucking on your Fine. giant lolly with the sunglasses and shit. It is funny right, how Frank much Lockner, the what? iconography of the poster. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just, This is going to be tied to me for the rest of my life. You're yeah. the one who wrote Lolly Story. You went out and got the Lolly. Okay. I didn't ask for this. You're the one who's going to win the Pulitzer <laughs> for Lolly Story. I didn't ask no. for anyone to talk about my Lolly. Lolly yeah. Story. Bitly.com uh, slash Lolly. Right. <laughs> she doesn't even eat the Lolly That's what I was going to say. No, it's funny does. how much yeah. the iconography of the movie is. The well, it's also movie. like I thought the movie was in color. Yeah. Because of the yes. poster. I remember being surprised I think when all I was sorts a teenager. Stuff, the poster is better than the movie. Can we, just between the tagline, the imagery... Sure. The poster's better than the movie. The poster's movie. perfect. The poster eats this movie's lunch. I think so. I don't know. It's also short. The movie's got sellers. Much the poster's so short. Sellers' <laughs> name's on the poster. Yeah, that's true. It does true. say. Yeah, if yeah, it had, you don't see it. She's with right. Peter if it had funny like, if all of the faces are like well, just on the corners uh, or whatever. Around yeah, or like, like a parenthetical here. being like, and he's doing something weird. Yeah. Uh, that might work. <laughs> well, like, I like that in an old poster where like the guy who's doing something weird has sort of torn open part of the poster and is popping his head out like "Ah, look out for me though i shouldn't be here i'm the surprise yeah um here's some ideas that warner brothers for example had on how to make this movie palatable for the Hayes code uh lowly three to one age her up make her 15 16 right a little more like 27 45 uh, two, Stanley, keep going. To a big thing for them, apparently, and apparently this was something that got suggested to Nabucco a mm-hmm. lot. Have them actually get married? I guess just sort of with the thought of like, well, if they're married, then it's sort of like, it's legal, like right. Everyone's put their head in their hands at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kubrick said, but "This is also it's like it, what this is like fucking five years after the Jerry Lee Lewis shit, where he's like, what's the problem? I married her, and everyone's like, you're not allowed in. That's not right. Well, although he was We're allowed. related." What's um, the big deal? But like, but it's like I mean, it, so much in common. It makes like me jeans. think of like Hail Caesar or whatever. You just yes. imagine like these old studio guys being like, "All right, well, I'm reading the book," and they're like, huh, huh. Uh, "So you know, well, what if they got married?" Like, yeah. you know, they're just sort of like in yeah. suits pitching ideas. They're just like, well, "That would be fine, right?" Uh, what if they open a comic store? <laughs> got a bunch look, of cute dogs look, around. I read comic books about Dick Tracy beating people up. I don't know what this is, but you're asking me to solve a problem here. I don't know. Uh, what if Humbert Humbert's a cop and Lolita <laughs> is? Uh, <laughs> held captive and he saves her and they never fall in love. <laughs> like, I, that's just how I imagine some of these studio conversations going. And then Kubrick apparently was like, the Hays Code will not, that, that's not going to solve your problem. Like, sure. that, that, it's still not going to get past the Hays Code just because you got them <laughs> pretend married in your pretend yeah. movie. Um, but basically, I guess the whole time they would just shoot alternate stuff and show it to the MPAA to kind of keep them off their backs. Wild. They would shoot like milder stuff. Okay. Like just a scene of God approving. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. This is just and right. <laughs> He's a complicated character, and the movie is not outright condemning or condoning. God just comes in to say stuff like that. Depiction does not equal endorsement. Right. Uh, the MPAA, in their Hays Code form at this point, uh-huh. their biggest suggestion with the actual movies are the seduction scene. The initial seduction scene between Humbert and Lolita should fade out a lot earlier. Uh huh. Again, it's kind of like, but then the movie's gonna keep going. Like, I know. But but this is the thing with like movie censorship, where it's just it always seems so funny. And then you hear directors later on about these conversations they have with the rating board, where they're like, "Can you just thrust twice and then we cut?" Like, 
And you're like, why is that better? Like, you know, versus I mean, eight thrusts. Our, our buddy Chris White talks about that all the time. But like the amount of what what he called frame fucking they had to do right. over the American first American pie. pie, where it was oh, like yeah. literally like how many thrusts go into the pie from what angle? Right. At, at, at what velocity is the difference between R and NC-17? Um, like, yeah, if it, once he's fucked the pie, he's fucked the pie. The film got an X rating uh-huh. in England. Sure. It got a condemned from the Legion of Decency. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You don't want that. Nope. <laughs> that, they should bring that back. I think they did condemned. for DC Legion of Super Pet. <laughs> 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 They're like, come on, this is just craven. But it did get the code, code seal of approval, uh-huh. which meant that MGM picked it up. Yep. Uh, and, you know, other studios had uh, run away, mm-hmm. obviously. Uh, and, of course, the battle to get the film approved was incorporated into the iconic tagline of the film on the poster, sure. which Griffin Newman says is better than the movie. Yeah, I stand by it. Yeah, No, I don't mind yeah. it. What's, I'm trying to think of the most recent thing where the tagline or any of the marketing has like relied on the production. And all I can think of is that bad North Korea movie. The interview? Yeah. Do they have a tagline like that? I don't like, think so. But I I'm feel like, like, is it on Netflix now as like the movie Kim Jong? And didn't want you to see or some shit. Oh, maybe, yeah. Um, I, I think, can't think of it. I wish they just sort of did more stuff with that. You yeah, know, remember how weird that was? Yeah, yeah, weird time. Not a good movie. Who no, which makes it movie? all the weirder. I know. If well, I only just, it was good. I had to write about Franco playing Castro, and then I was like, which is so, which also that that press release is so funny and so crazy. All oh, right, Rogan directed it with Goldberg, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird. Everything about that movie is weird. I don't approve of James Franco being cast as uh, Castro. No good, very bad. Don't Even do though it. he is the exact same bone structure when they ran it through a computer program or something. Yeah. Oh, you convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when okay. you say that. Yeah. You do um, know that's their fucking defense. I know, I know, right? whatever. But there's just like it's some a, It's dumb... a physiognomy. Physiognomy, we, that word yeah. came back. Let's get yeah. it back out. They're like, look, if you have a suggestion of a better skull <laughs> shape, we'll hear it. I don't know. We couldn't find one. Just get Fidel back. Bring him back. Bring Fidel back. Huh? CGI Fidel? Fidel back. Yeah, hologram Fidel. It's Look, not even about him, really. You might as well have a CGI one. Sure. Uh, yeah, do a Peter Cushing and Rogue One thing. Yes. Um, I think there's a great quote from Kubrick about what he okay. thinks doesn't work about the movie. Uh-huh. Fun, like, fundamentally. Years mm-hmm. later, he's reflecting. Sure. The important thing in the novel is to think that by, in, on the outset that Humbert is enslaved by his perversion and only at the end, when Lolita is married and pregnant, do you realize that he does love her. So he's saying, like, the end hits so hard in the book because you've never been in that mindset. And then by the end, sure. you're like, huh, he does actually, there is something more than just this obsession he's talking about. Whereas in the, he says, in my film, the fact that his sexual obsession could not be portrayed at all yeah. just implies that he's in love with her from the start. So like, he's like, it just kind of plays as a slightly more traditional, w- weird love like story. You're not, you don't really get into the fact that this guy is obsessed with preteen girls. Right. Like right. at all, like it's no, not I think, addressed I think, in the movie. I think that's it exactly. Like if he it, yeah. imagine, look, imagine if the movie begins red velvet curtain. Yeah, maybe a little dry ice. Okay, okay. Yeah. James Mason comes out wearing a smoking jacket. Yeah. Okay. Got a okay. big cigar and a cup of tea, and he's like, "Hello, I'm Humbert Humbert. I fucking love nine year olds." You know, and then you're like, "Whoa, whoa, this guy is awful. I hate this guy." You know, then the then thing. it's look, different. It also doesn't. Work, you guys think and that's it's a good idea? Unbearably sad and difficult to watch. You guys think that's but a good idea? But the Adrian Line movie does that basically <laughs> right, the opening, and I do think it's the film's for, advantage. Right. You don't think it's a good Thumbs idea? Thumbs down, David. <laughs> you don't like my smoking I, jacket? No, I, I, I agree. Yes. I agree. He should come out fucking like Rod Serling style. <laughs> Hello, I'm a awful pervert. Yeah. Imagine if you will. Um, but I do think it's interesting that he's like. Because I was so handcuffed and be able to dramatize the erotic portion of this guy's psychology. Yeah. It just plays like a weird love story at the end. Like, I don't well, know. Well, I think like, either you start with sort of the weird thing that... Ha- I don't really remember the thing in his past. There's a girl from his he, childhood. He, he loses it, it, his virginity it, to a, a girl when he's like 14 years old. And she and then dies. she dies of consumption. Immediately, some shit. pretty much. Like, I mean, I think you either start with that or you start with him shooting Quilty for dramatic tension, but you don't get to have two beginnings to that movie. Right. And I right. think they pick the one that makes like the vehicle of the movie work better at the expense of like... Sure. But the whole the heart of it, the whole thing, which is like psychologically sort of uh, uh, sourced and backed up that very often pedophilia is some sort of like effect of people being frozen developmentally at that age. 
right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the book and the Adrian Lyme version go out of the way, their way to say, like, this is why. Uh, yeah. And this movie, it's, yes, and it's part of also the weird, like, his worldview of her is externalized. Everyone else is calling her Lolita. No one else seems to pick up on what's going on. Quilty is like the fucking Joker, like maneuvering the entire universe wow. around having this Joker? secret affair. Yeah. That it doesn't feel like it, 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 it feels like a movie about a man who is at odds with himself. And that's the great tragedy of it rather than a movie about a man who is like, you know, like fundamentally fucking cursed. Yeah, to, yeah. As as far as you know, when he comes into this movie, this is a guy whose life has been normal up to the point that he walked right. into the door of this house, right? And that's versus like, a guy who's like an insane lunatic. This from, girl kind of for a breaks long time. him, and yeah. then the movie tries to kind of at the end go like, but the love was real, so yeah. Look, he did care. Look at him giving the money. No, I f- it feels karmic at the end, though. Yeah, it feels course. like every yeah. step of the way. He's making the wrong decision. And yeah, then the a, consequence is that his things, the situation is getting worse and worse and worse. Well, yes. Yes, he is fundamentally entirely dysfunctional and awful. Yeah, you know what's uh, a really so, bad yeah. decision? Right. Uh, to tell her that her mom's still alive? Yeah. Yeah. Where you're just like, well, whenever the shoe's dropping on this. Uh, the lows, the, the desperation yeah. of this character yeah. is sickening. Kubrick later finally just comes out and says it and says, if I'd realized how severe the limitations would be, I probably just wouldn't when have made it. it. Yeah. Um, which is fairly damning of him. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, I when you unpack that quote... Well, he just like, he's like, I, I, there was something about this novel that I thought was powerful and was I just could not realize. fundamentally yeah. dramatize it because yeah. of like the fact that I could not portray this guy as an outright like sort of broken monstrous person so instead, he's just a weirdo. I, I mean, I'm, I'm but once now again, I think it's like he's assuming he could have squared the circle in a time without content restrictions versus just being like what we keep on talking about. Like, you just can't fucking make this book into a movie. Well, I mean, also, the fundamental thing is, as you said, there's the line movie that does everything he couldn't do. Right. And that movie is boring, like, yeah, more than anything and not very successful. No. Case closed. And like okay. Adrian Lyne made Flashdance, which is a movie that you're like, every second of Flashdance, you're like, makes no sense, makes no sense. But you're right. watching it, you're just like, I'm having fun. He's kind of the king of that. Lyne is usually good like, at like threading stupid needles. Obviously, Lolita is different from Flashdance. But on paper, Adrian Lyne in the 1990s with that cast making Lolita more faithful to the book, you're like, if anyone's ever going to pull it off, it's him right now. Sure. But I remember when it came out, people were like, don't do it. Yeah, like, yeah. why are you doing yeah. this? I mean, if Cooper had waited, I wonder what sure. would have happened. Even if, even if, if he, he waited sat to like the 70s for, or something. Yeah. If, if he waited five years. Because yeah. I do feel like, based on the quotes you shared, all of which are new to me, that he fundamentally understands the source material that he's working with and what yeah, he wants to sure. be saying and is limited just by the nature of the times. Yeah, but, I just still wonder how much you can ever externalize this book. Yeah, to- yeah. Like totally. in Flashdance, she's a welder. Right. Okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She dances at a local bar in Pittsburgh right. that somehow allows massively like overcomplicated cabaret acts to perform. Buckets of water. Buckets of water. A lady like who's like, I'm a subway systems. train. <laughs> right. Like it's, it's not just like people dancing. It's like really complicated visual yeah. bits. Yeah. She wants to be a ballerina. Yeah. She meets another welder who's rich, mm-hmm. who takes a shine to her. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And because he gets her the right audition, she gets to do a ballerina audition. Like, he gets her in with the right Dude, people. She gets to do a ballerina audition. Yeah, what are you talking about? I can't right. believe this. And David. then she gets to be a ballerina. And you watch this movie, and you're like, oh, this is a bit silly. And, and people come in and are like, no, 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 the most successful film of the year, basically. You don't understand. I and never knew that. I didn't know that ballerina, off. actually. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that was the premise of Flashdance. The premise of Flashdance is she's just a simple welder who only just wishes to be a ballerina, and her way into doing that is doing kind of like sexy but not stripping. Yeah, I think I thought it was dancing. like Footloose. No, she's got a like skeezy Footloose flash dancer way. Footloose is equally into- insane though. Footloose yeah. is like the the best dancer in the world arrives at the one town where dancing isn't allowed. Like Footloose also makes no sense. Yes. He's like, how I express myself is dancing, and they're like, uh-uh, no. Yeah, wait, was the dance movie? 
Center Stage? That's not 98, though. That's like 2000. Center Stage is like 2000. Yeah. That's, I was like, it took them a while to figure out you could just make a movie about dance. Right. Sure. You'd be like, I want to be a dancer. And they're like, seems hard. That's the movie. <laughs> yeah, Rather right, than right. like, I want to be a dancer, but convoluted. <laughs> right, and they remained successful when they started doing that. Like, Save the Last Dance and Step Up, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Once they just cut out the tension and went like, it's about someone who wants to dance. Yeah. Then it works. Mm-hmm. Bosley Crowther. I just uh-huh. want to read you him bodying Lolita. Sure. Uh, film critic for the New York Times. People yeah. At the time. How did they ever make a movie of Lolita? According to the poster. The answer to that question, posed in the advertisements of the picture, which arrived at the Lowe's State and the Murray Hill last night. Love that in old theater, uh, old movie reviews, where they yeah. tell you, like, the two Manhattan theaters yeah. you can see it at. Is as simple as this. They didn't. Oh, boy. They made a movie from a script in which the characters have the same name as the characters in the book, and the plot bears a resemblance to the original, and no. some of the incidents are vaguely similar, but the Lolita Nabokov wrote as a novel and the Lolita he wrote to be a film are two conspicuously different things. Oh, and he's, so on he's and so laughing on. and writing this. Yeah, he is. He's, he's like, He's, he's, he's having a laugh. The typewriter. Yeah. Kale write about this? Uh, I don't, she would have been working. Let's yeah. see. I, I, uh, it's not in here. I feel like she would have hated this, but. He loves it. She loves it. Oh, she Kale's loves it. pro. Okay, I never know. I, I like her because I never know what she's going to say about something. Um, yeah, no, she calls it one of... Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, she hates it. This website calls this review one of Kale's best reviews. Oh, okay. I was confused by the, the capsule. No, I think that she had a similar... Are you on a, a top uh, 20 uh, deadliest Pauline Kale body blows listicle? <laughs> Crack.com. 18 <laughs> times Pauline Kale absolutely shredded a masterpiece. <laughs> um, no, she seems more positive on it. And in okay. fact, she makes fun of Bosley Crowther in this very review. Says okay, he's slay. always counted on to miss the point. That's back when movie uh, critics were just like, Bosley Crowther, who's as ugly as he is fat. You know, like, you're just like, whoa. (laughs) There were also like six of them. They were like the Greek gods. (laughs) Serious. Which one are you? Right, they're all wearing like capes and shit. What's your gimmick? (laughs) But she's more positive on it. Yeah, yeah. I think you read so much of the response to this movie at the time, and there was a lot of like points for audacity to everyone involved. Where it's just like, what courage to make this? Me, I, I mean, I don't like this film. I do think it's fascinating. It is very compelling. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, but I watched it one time to have seen every Stanley Kubrick film. That is why yes. I eventually watched yeah. it. And I remember at the time liking it or what, yeah. being like, well, it's, there's nothing like it. It's interesting. On rewatch, I just, I just really, it really loses me for the, la- the second hour yeah. plus. Yes. Really post Shelly Winters. Yeah. The seller's stuff does not charm me as much as it charms no. you guys. I grew up. I mean, I, 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 just, oh, I don't know if I'm charmed. I mean, so yeah, charm isn't am, the right word. Or whatever. Be- it, bewildered interested and entranced. Or, yeah. yeah. I don't like it. I though. mean, you guys have stopped me. I was said, oh, I, I grew up twice and you guys talked over me, which is crazy because I was about to lob Wait, do you a have something to say? for you guys. <laughs> you have something you want to say about your life? Say. I grew up in England. What? And. I think that really has turned me against all the great British comic figures because... Okay. Just because, like, you They're just... too revered? Yeah, you spend so much time, and, like, watching TV back then, especially back when there were only fucking four channels. Yeah. And it'd be like, the BBC's like, 100 greatest comedians. And they basically be like, number 100, Peter Sellers, number 99... Peter Sellers again. We're gonna just do him for fifty. You know, they just they just Peter Sellers, Morecambe and Wise, Peter Sellers, Peter Sellers, Peter Cook, Peter yeah. Sellers. You're just like, I get it, I get it, I get it. You know, it is good, sure. And I think Strange Love is a masterpiece, and he's so <laughs> funny in it. And I think he's funny in other stuff. Uh, but like, I don't know. He creeps me out in this movie. He's mostly. a creep. He's a creep. And this is the thing where I'm saying I do think this is the movie that gets closest to him playing himself, not in his like sexual predilections but in his like odd his I can't be a real person yeah day. no and I think that's what he was like I, I, yeah I we have think... a dwindling number of comedians let alone comedic actors who do a thing that well, I think is so funny and also I would never want to be anywhere near that. cancel culture they're too well, afraid of course because of cancel culture also, not that I want to fucking dip into this but it's like oh boy. this oh. is why every <laughs> single week the like discourse echo chamber is losing their mind fighting over the rehearsal because oh, sure. Nathan Fielder has built himself to be inscrutable you know, and I don't say this as a brag. Yeah. I still don't know what the rehearsal is about. I don't know anything about it. All I know is that Nathan Fielder is in it, and people are very I'm animated about it. In both directions. 
I really don't know. I'm but not I, watching it. I do it. think it is like even someone like Sasha Baron I'm, Cohen. But I'm not not watching it because I hate him or love him or whatever. like. Yeah. I just haven't gotten around to it, and I just sort of see people like yelling about very abstract things. I feel like Sasha Baron Cohen, and I, you know, mm. not to his credit or detriment, didn't really put any energy into trying to hold on to any mystery about himself. Like he talks about that he doesn't like doing interviews as himself, but when he does them, you're like. You seem normal. You're not someone whose like skin is like. Yeah, he's maybe the closest modern example we have. Because Fielder's not doing. I mean, I can't. I actually can't speak on Fielder. I haven't seen enough to speak on yeah. him. You haven't played the field. Nope. Let's play the box office. Well, okay, no. okay. Sorry. What's up? One last thing I wanted to say about the yep. movie. Um, there's a song that's playing when we first meet Lolita. Mm. Oh yeah, sure. original original composition. It's an I think. original composition. Right. What is it? Monster like, Mash or what well, is it? Well, it's got that <laughs> sound to it. No, yeah. truly, it's That's like true. a very yeah. old-fashioned sounding song. Mm-hmm. It fucking kind of rips. Did you look oh. up what it is? I did last night, okay. and now I like unless I'm playing it yeah. out loud. See if you can find the title. Oh, we looked this up. I feel. Yeah, Lolita Yaya. Yeah, the Yaya song by Nelson Riddle. It, it charted. Oh right, right. It was written for this. This is a fucking, okay, this is kind of like, this is kind of a solid song where I was like, this would be in a fucking Wes Anderson movie. Yes. If it was a, like, you know, wasn't in this, this movie. This is the other thing, like, so much of the music in this movie is so jaunty and fun, and it makes me uncomfortable. It makes me really uncomfortable, but it, it's but on like, its this, own, is, this song is great. It's oh, a, man. It's very effective. I'd love to see I'm a just... little stop motion dog dancing to this song. <laughs> oh, yeah. God, this movie is so fucking weird. Like, I'm watching, so I Googled this song, right, and a YouTube video plays. Patches on his elbows. And it's basically like a montage of the film is yeah. just playing, right? Yeah. And, like, I'm being reminded of some scenes, like the movie The Drive-In Theater, which sure. is like a clever Kubrick bit of uh-huh. like watching how the hands move around. Oh, sure. You know, like where they both put oh, their hands yeah. on him and he ha- grabs both their hands and he lets go of Shelly Winters and he puts his hand uh-huh. on Lolita and she puts her hand on him. But then Shelly Winters like puts it and, he's, and everyone's like, uh. The, the sh- nail polish uh, yes. being the only uh, outward physicalization of, of sex in this movie. And then you have like shots like this where it's like, He's sitting in his fucking bathrobe with a fucking cravat, and she's like next to him with a piece of toast, and you're like, what like a weird leaning movie. in, like sort of who me? And he's like, <laughs> that toast looks oh, so good in that scene. How's that buttered toast you're yeah, eating? It looks so yeah. good. You the know toast? what's fucking good? Buttered toast. Piece of buttered toast. Get out of here. Yeah. Nothing better. There is sort of this very funny micro trend on food TikTok right now where people are quote unquote discovering just eating bread with butter yeah. on it and maybe a little bit of salt. And it's like, what the, the fuck's going, kind of going on? When I was, if you'll allow me to reminisce, if you'll Please. allow me to reminisce, um, when I was a kid in England, in London, what? London, England, what? I took piano lessons every week with a lovely Like year. hell you did. Well, um, in her house, Andre. Oh, I thought you'd have like a Dame Thwing <laughs> Whistful. <laughs> Mrs. Bagthorpe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she was kind of, she was like a classic sort of slightly dotty British piano Shadow teacher lady. Brimble Brat. <laughs> right. Where, but like, it, it, she was a type of English person where sure. it's like, her house is kind of full of knickknacks and she's got like a long flowy This is why I asked. And, uh, I'm picturing but, the type. But so my mom would pick me up at school. Humble at right. Hanover School, which is where I went. Hanover Primary School, my primary school which was a, a crazy old Victorian building built for asthmatic children. Oh, boy. Uh, it had a rooftop playground. It was right by the Regent's Canal. And the mm-hmm. idea, I think, was like, oh, the water. That'll cure their asthma. Yeah. Um, and she would take me to a greasy spoon called the Riedel Rooms. Uh, and I would eat two pieces of buttered toast Yeah. before I went to the piano lesson. That's, I think like that's why I love buttered toast. Yeah, what do they call you'll... it there? <laughs> So ridiculous. Oh, yeah, blimey, governor. I don't fucking know. What? Two sheets to no end, Uh <laughs> No toast with butter. I don't know what Sometimes you get it. some, like, crazy, like, big boy. It's true. Jack. Like, like bubble and squeak. Like, do you know what bubble and squeak is? That's, like, the, yeah. to yes. me, the funniest, you know, British uh, yes. greasy spoon order. No, you it's know, a potato thing, right? It's basically like potatoes and cabbages. And oh, yeah. you, you fry it and, you know, it, it bubbles and goes squeaks. bubbles and squeaks. Right? Um, yeah. When you get some like big crazy lumberjack breakfast, I feel like oftentimes the the two pieces of buttered toast on the side are the most exciting part. Yeah, you go through that. And they're you're like, so What's all this good. other shit I ordered. Yeah, I don't want fucking sausage links. Give me more toast. Give me a big tower well, of toast. Well, for years I was like, yeah, give me the English muffin. Give me the right. challah. And now I'm just like, give me the most plain bread. 
with toast. Yeah. And I'll make my choice I with def- how I want to use it. I'll like default to doing bagel with cream cheese most days. Mm-hmm. But then it's like sometimes I treat myself by being like, keep it real simple. Fucking just toasted butter with bagel. That was a thing I hadn't even it's heard of until so I moved out here. Goddamn hard. Unbelievable to me. Yeah. What's that, that you could that you could put butter on a bagel. Never even thought of it. Thought that was a vehicle for cream cheese only. No, toasted butter didn't know, bagel. Didn't know. Oh, One of the life's the thing, finer pleasures. The thing pleasures. too is Agreed. that order. I love a butter bagel. What people don't know is if you get at a bagel place or whatever, basically they put on such a sick That's amount of butter. Yes. Too, it's great. Yes. That it's like, it's like you couldn't do it to yourself. That's the thing. Yeah. You ha- someone I've else has it. to put butter that bagel amount of home. butter. I literally had different. a buttered bagel for, for breakfast this morning. It's from incredible. From the bagel pub. Like from, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, someone yeah. made me a buttered bagel. Yeah. It's like how an egg waffle. Yeah. Well, that like when you pour syrup on an egg waffle and it gets wet. Yes. Like that's what they mm. do to your bagel. Well, your the your bagel is butter all the way down. <laughs> then they so tightly wrap it in the paper and then the tinfoil over it. So when you take it out, the entire thing is just cased in butter. When I was really broke. Like it's just the bl- butter has just swished around in the wrapping. Yes, I love yeah. it. But when I was really broke in New York, like my breakfast would be a buttered bagel untoasted from one of those carts. Oh, sure. You know how they just have them wrapped in yes. saran wrap? Just yeah. an, uh, uh, and like with yeah. just yellow ass butter, like right. whatever, margarine, whatever yeah. it is for like 50 cents. Yeah. Love that. That's the other thing though. Butter bagel still pretty cheap from even a real bagel Even place. from a fancy bagel place. Yeah. They'll only charge you a couple bucks for a yeah. bagel. I would do a salt bagel. With, with the butter, butter. Ah, it's too much. I do everything no, just so you're balancing no, no. it. No, I think that's good. I I'll try some extra days, salt, but not all but extra. Salt. I love a salt yeah. bagel, like uh, toasted salt bagel. So good. Man, bagels roll so fucking hard. What if I do a spinoff podcast about bagels? I mean, I'm all for it, but what's how does the podcast work? Get, Talk just about give bagels. Me, bring a topping. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Actually, pick a, you know. Yeah. We go to a bagel shop together. I gotta guess. I guess I gotta get a shop to sponsor it. Or is it just like you have a guest on every week and you're like, so what do you think What's of bagels? What's your order? Yeah. And you just sort of see how long you can sustain that conversation. I don't think I'd ever run dry. It's my favorite thing to talk about. I do love talking bags. Yeah. What do you think of those rainbow bagels? I hate them. Right? Aren't they gross? Don't it must make bagels do that. Ben, I don't want to burn horrible. this here because I'll get an entire like fucking arc out of this on my bagel podcast. Wow. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't like the meat. I'm very purist. About, I'm like, there's like six kinds of bagels. To Honestly, me. Yeah. I might have to cut this all out and just save this as an excerpt for the future yeah. episode of your bagel show. Yeah, because David, you'll be a guest early on. So don't say any more bagel opinions here. And Fran will be as well because you're one of our best. Oh, thank one of you. our finest. Thank you. We shared the Lolly article in the blank check text thread. Oh. And Marie bless. just said, God, Fran is just the coolest. That's that's so nice to hear about me poisoning myself. We didn't even comedy. discuss my wedding. I figured this would be the wedding episode. We can talk about the, I thought we were gonna talk about the wedding too. Hear about your wedding. I totally forgot. Fine. This okay, is the first your wedding episode was recorded all... after my wedding, which everyone in this room attended. Your wedding which, was great. Including yeah. Ben's girlfriend, who's not in the room, but she's she's sort of in the next yeah, room. And also, I brought my cat. No, you didn't bring Aww. your cat. That would be nice, though. Like, can we be honest nice. here? Stolen fucking valor. You want some credit for your wedding? You got married two years ago. No vows were exchanged in front of us. It was just a party. That is true. It was I had a great it was, time. It was a great party. I'll be clear with you. It was billed as a, a wedding party. I know. A, that's uh, why I'm now, celebration now you're You think saying. David stole valor? I was valor just using shorthand. From okay. other people who got married? I think so. But I did get married. I got married this week. No one's talking about it. You didn't tell me. Okay, well, I'll it, it's not going to, well. I'll just <laughs> oh, say <God>. Uh-oh. <laughs> that trouble in paradise. <laughs> yes, go I'll ahead. Just say that you and your your wife looked great. You both really looked great. She looked great. I looked fine. Come Take, on, okay. you you both Take look great. It, it was a beautiful it. night. I think she looked. At really least good. two Dua Lipa songs played. Yeah, absolutely. DJ Mariko. Well, ben, so Mariko Mori Mori. I was out. doing. I'll shout her out on my podcast. I don't know if you know this. The Marika bit I was Morimoto. doing is I kept telling everybody that I actually came up with the playlist. Yeah. Oh, did you? I didn't hear. Yeah, that. it was a really funny bit. Yeah. yeah. The other thing, no one believed me. Ben and no, because Marika was crushing it, and everyone yeah. knew it. Ben and I were <laughs> busting a gut at the table when you got up to make your speech. You right? were kind of at the podcast table. I'd say the cool kids table. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, I was at the cool table. You were at the cool. I table. thought you were Thank at you. the hot table. No, no. Fran was at the hottie table. Yeah. Oh, all right. Whatever. Thank you. Although Ange dubbed it the bisexual girls with glasses table. Yeah. But you know. sure. Yeah, six of one, half dozen of the other. But no, I'm sorry. Yeah, you were at the podcast. Too. Gets up. Mm. Thank you all for coming. Means Gives so a nice much. Speech. She said her that. name. We're gonna have to bleep it out. But whatever. I'm sorry. David's wife, Forky. Forky comes, gets up and gets goes. Up. 
says, what? Thank no. you. No. <laughs> <laughs> <Support you> bits. <laughs> Trash. <laughs> And she threw herself in the garbage. What is love? David had to fish her out. Mm -hmm. Um, No, but she was like, thank you for coming. It means so much to have everyone here. It's been Mm -hmm. so long overdue. Uh, I made a joke about you growing up in England. Bam. Uh, killed. Crazy. She knew that was Honestly, crushed. didn't expect that. She knew it crushed. And like said it and then pretty much directly looked over to our table yeah, and was like, Well, she needed you guys to, right, to get it. like that. Yeah, exactly. Get it going. Well, it was like a very like gracious sort of like host table setting and said like when we got married, you know, two years ago, we've been waiting to have this event. And then you interjected with like, I actually did the math. It is a, uh, it is. Okay. I didn't interject. It, the microphone was passed to me and sure. I did do the math. The first thing you said when the microphone yeah. was passed to you was, you did the math that it was actually two days short of being exactly it two was. years. It was. It was a, so it was it was a year and 360 700. Days. It was, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, right. I mean, I, just, I think I said the amount of days. I can't you remember. said the sure amount of days. Yeah. I mean, it was the equivalent of you having the laptop in front of you right now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you said the amount of days. Ben and I looked at each other, started busting up. Yeah, 728 days. Right. You don't love uh, speaking publicly in front of people. I think it's fair to say your wife is also very shy about those well, things. Well, she's genuinely shy and wrote something out and, right. and said You're it. You're less shy than she is, but you don't love being on, like, mic in front of a crowd. I don't love it, but I also was not... I was. We were so stressed and busy preparing a zillion things, yeah. and I was like, I don't know, I'll just fucking say something, or who cares? So D- David, David Rees and I were sitting together, and we were talking about how good both of us are at wedding speeches and how rude it was that neither of us were asked. And I kept on joking I had three speeches planned. I was going to do three different speeches at different points in the ceremony. And, and then there was no ceremony. But so we were like rating everyone's speech as it happened, right? right? Being like, good move. Like Molly comes up and you're like, she's locked and loaded my, for bear, right? She's going to kill it, whatever. And you, once <laughs> passes you the mic, the first thing you do is the correction on the number of days. Yeah. And then you go like, I don't know, uh... There's uh, food. Uh, does everyone get food? And uh, yeah, I kind of laid out. I'm like, oh, we're going to eat, and then there'll be some toast, right. and then we'll have dessert, and then we'll dance, You're I doing guess? like floppy yeah, right. Muppet arms, and you're yep. like dancing or whatever, and we just turned to each other, and we went, God, I didn't think he'd go this emotional. <laughs> 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 and then the rest of the night, we were just dining out on the bits about how, like, I don't usually cry at weddings, but David opened up to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not my fine. You were just like, I can't get this vibe. over with fast enough. I don't know. What are the things that happen in this wedding? Uh, sit. I in the chairs look. at your tables and then uh, talk to the other people who are at your tables right, and then you can go over to other this. tables and talk to other people. And then later you're like, oh, and also we have to make a toast. I'm being told. Yeah, I'm being told, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most David shit in the world. Yeah, no, that was actually, okay, so that was not my fault. Um, what? When we arrived at the, and again, planning a wedding with a toddler is not a wedding. Why would you let the toddler make decisions? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you think? She'd be like, ah. you should have done that. All right, fine. She, we'll she would have bought the place up. <laughs> really? The purple? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, we arrive at the wedding uh, venue and our caterer is like, oh, and by the way, we want to give everyone like a champagne glass filled well, with sure. champagne, like, you know, gratis, like, you know, on us uh-huh. for a champagne toast. And we were like, oh, sure, that sounds good. And then I just totally spaced on it. And then we sit down and my wife was like, wait. Like we see the glass, and we're you like, you were oh. supposed to leave the toast. <laughs> I was like, what right. else are we gonna do? This everyone's got it in front of them. Right. So then I'm like, Mariko, give me the fucking microphone. I was like, right. ah, anyway, toast to love. You're like, oh, I don't know, we're supposed to make a toast to love. So, uh, toast to love. So that was not entirely my fault. Uh, it wasn't your fault, but even still, the energy of everything you said was just like, ah, it's it's when people parody you summing up the plot of the movie too quickly, where you it were like, bad. I don't know what happens at this wedding. We're all gonna get too drunk and dance. I don't know. What do you want from me? Like, every time you got on the mic was, I don't know, what do you want from me? <laughs> I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I think it's good. Having, think having it was funny. attended funny. plenty of weddings where the opposite v- vibe is true, where it's like that everyone our is... minds. You never want to... We didn't want any of the sort of, like, everyone... The glasses are clinking and the silk... Because someone just keeps talking and everyone... Or the, right. I had three yeah, speeches. The, tense, right? the Ready to go. I've been working them out at the cellar. I will also say, and I'm sure people who are listening who've done a wedding, you know, like it is that thing where you're just completely disassociated. Sure. And like I ate the food in that way of like, well, I know I need to eat some food because yeah, food is fuel, but I couldn't even taste it. I was just like, uh, I don't know. You know, you're just so out of it. Yeah. And then eventually, and then I sort of settled down. But like the early part of it, I was just like, it's so weird to be in one room. I said this, one of you maybe, mm-hmm. and every minute, Someone, one of your best friends comes in looking hot. 
<laughs> like that's truly what it was. Like I'm in an empty. It's basically I'm in an empty big room. For sure. And and Ben was the first to arrive. By the way, really. Shout, Shout out Ben. Fifteen minutes okay. early. Yep. Okay. Wow. Um, it wasn't me though. That was all my girlfriend. Oh sure. Um, well, she's a watch influencer. But like just that weird sensation of be like on time. oh well, and then there's my friend from you know from from I know them from college. Oh, sure. and I know this person. And they're all looking great, you know. Like, and you're like, of course, I know that's what's going to happen. But it's a weird experience, well, to watch I, it especially all after two years of like not getting yeah. to see a lot of people. Right? You're yeah, like, it's, it's your thing. own right. curated big fish ending. Yeah, but you're weird. not dying. Yeah, and especially when this many people have not been able to be in the same room and people yeah. have been not traveling to other places. Like, no, no, not no, even no. People, yeah. Is it also a thing where you know everyone's looking at you all the time? A little bit. I mean, Alex Ross Perry kept looking saying at me. I that was, I was. What? No. Being like presidential. He said I was very presidential. And then I like yes. had a tie and I kept like walking over to tables and being like, how's everyone doing? I don't know. He was roasting me for that. You felt more like a, the owner of a, an Italian restaurant. Oh, well, that's what I like. <laughs> that's what I want. One time I was, when I was a political reporter, and I know we uh -huh. got to do the box office game, yeah, Jesus Christ. Uh, I once covered like an election night party in Harlem for like a local election. And mm -hmm. it was this great like old bar Charlie in Randall? Harlem. Not Charlie Wrangle, but you know, it was, it was, um, fuck. I'll remember his name okay. later. Um, and this like fucking gent comes over to me at one <laughs> point, this old guy yeah. in like a great like blazer. And I was like, hi. He was like, hi. And I was like, hi. And he's like, I'm the proprietor. And I was like, oh, uh, that's cool. I want to introduce myself like that. Yeah. At this like cool, like jazzy bar. And yeah. fuck, what's his name? It doesn't, well, who cares? I don't know. Box so. office game. Okay, so this film opens, and this film was a hit. hit. Yeah, mild hit, like nothing insane, but no, certainly relative its budget, to like, like five is million. this movie unreleasable? Right, and uh, opens. What's the date? You know, opens basically like June nineteen sixty two. The way it was one hundred sixty five opening weekend, <laughs> it beat Dead Man's Chest, right? But then it. Uh, sorry, in its dumb. first, it seems dumb. wide weekend. So yeah. a couple, which is what we're doing in a couple sure. weeks into its release, it's opening number five. Okay, it's not bad. No, number one at the box office, Griffin. Mm -hmm. It's a Delbert Mann comedy. Delbert Mann comedy. Two okay. giant stars. Okay. Uh, it's a rom com. Uh, okay. Two giant stars. Uh, man and woman rom com. Delbert Mann. Yes. Is Cary Grant one of them? He is. And he's playing, and stop me if this sounds too sure. crazy, a rich guy. Okay. And the lady is mm -hmm. not rich. She's unemployed and kind of figuring it out. And Hello. it's kind of a whoop. Okay. Hmm. What is this movie called? The film is called That Touch of Mink. And oh, it stars sure. Cary Grant and Doris Day. Sure. Sure. Um, sure. Big hit. I'm too tired to guess. Huh? You're too, too tired, tired to guess. guess. Oh, yeah. he's tired. I don't know. Uh, big hit. Uh -huh. uh, made $17 million. Okay. Nominated for three Oscars. Mm -hmm. You know, just a classic Cary Grant hit. Just a touch. Number two at the box office is a political drama. Political drama. Is it not Manchurian Candidate? No, it's le it's a Preminger. It's less famous than like the absolute top tier 60s political dramas, but it is a Preminger movie. It does have a badass Saul Bass poster, and it stars like a bunch of heavy hitters. Um, it's, it's not about a, a fucking man for all seasons. Well, no, that's that's no. Uh, you know, I'm, British, I'm just running through British titles royalty. in my head. I know, I know, I know. Okay, he knows. Well, uh, you got Henry Fonda, Charles Lawton, uh, Burgess Meredith. Do I know this Gene movie? Cerny. Is this like a known title? It's a known title in that it's like a political phrase. Uh, it's about, I think, the confirmation hearings for a secretary of state, you know, back when they really made just the most exploited of trash. <laughs> um, Lois Cumberland uh, yeah. yeah. uh, It's called Advise and Consent Oh okay I was never gonna get that Cool poster though Cool poster It's a tag on a briefcase Yeah with the Cool title The capital It's a good title uh, Never yeah. seen it nope. A young Betty White is in it Oh Younger R.I.P. Yeah R.I.P. Bless up Bless uh, <laughs> Number three at the box office By the way I'm throwing a Betty Centennial tomorrow is it tomorrow? Yeah. It's just, it was too late for me to cancel. <laughs> <laughs> you already bought the flowers. Yeah, and I bought the magazine covers. Go on. Uh, you already booked DJ Mariko. Uh, number four, number three, number three at the box office yeah. is the Best Picture winner of 1970, uh, sorry, 1961. Uh, it's in its 37th week okay. of complete box office domination. It's one of the most famous films ever made. 
I might know it. Uh, it? What well, one best picture in 1961? It's not Sound of Music. No, but it it's is a musical. West Side Story. Oh, of course. It's West Side Story. Of course. The story of the West Side. The most West Side film ever made. Until Stevie even went maybe Took even a even little further, further west. west. 11th yeah. Avenue. Yeah. Um, this was just in a trivia thing I did. Mm. Go ahead. And I had said Sound of Music and got corrected. Right. So I watched you, you step learned your in the lesson. exact pitfall I did. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Number three, number uh-huh. four, sorry, uh, is another rom-com okay. starring some famous people. Okay. About hmm. three men and a looking little to meet lady. Oh. needs that are not being satisfied in their marriages. Their bachelor friend arranges for a quote-unquote kept woman who is in reality a sociology student studying the fantasies of contemporary American men. Sounds crazy, right? Uh, this isn't Balls of Fire. No. Good premise. It yeah. is kind what? of a crazy premise. What is this movie? It's called Boys Night Out. Okay. <laughs> and the boys are James Garner, Tony Randall, and I think Howard Duff. Huh. And the girl is Kim Novak. Huh. Uh, it's a Michael Gordon film. I've never seen it. Yeah. It sounds wild. She does, does not actually sleep with the men, to okay. be clear. But she keeps making each one think she's sleeping with the other ones, I think is sort of the gimmick. Interesting. Sort of the Three's Company style right. weird arrangement. This is exactly what you could do in the Hayes Code. Right. Uh, it's also got Patty Page. Joshua Gabor is in this film. Well, James Garner wrote in his memoirs that Novak was, quote, more interested in her makeup than the script. Okay. okay. Fucking James. James. Um, so that's Boys Night Out. Number five, Lolita. Ah. Some other films. Hatari. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, John Wayne uh, African game hunter rom-com. <laughs> I've never seen it. Howard Hawks movie. I bet it's good. It's a Howard Hawks movie. It's probably yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Bon Voyage, which is a Disney Fred McMurray movie. One I of think their I fun know ones. about that one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Henry Harry Willard makes good his promise to take his bride of 20 years on a long delayed trip by ship to Europe. They're accompanied by their kids. Comedy ensues. Reading here, Bon Voyage has been announced as a Disney Plus original series. Yep. Bosley Crowther didn't like it. Um, mm. Now, we've heard of uh, some other movies. We've, we've heard of Mrs. Harris Go to Paris. What about uh, Mr. Hobbs Taking a Vacation? The, the Monsieur Hello uh, remake? Yes, it's Jimmy Stewart, right? Yeah. As, yeah. Uh, as the Ulo t- I've never seen. Obviously. I haven't either. It's odd that it exists. Right? Isn't it odd that like that movie in particular is so much just his performance and his directing style. Right. The idea of remaking, it's like, it's not like the concept's that interesting. <laughs> Number nine is something called The, the Counterfeit Traitor. Okay. Starring William Holden. Okay. Some kind of espionage thriller film. Mm-hmm. And number 10 is Judgment at Nuremberg. Mm-hmm. Another heavy hitter mm-hmm. from 61. I almost guessed. I mean, you know. It's probably somewhere those, around here. One of those movies. Yeah. That's the box office game for Lolita. I don't have anything else for you guys. I, I don't either. Uh, Fran, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you for having me. To make it very clear, the the way we often book this show is we'll be like, who haven't we had on in a while? Who are people we, we've never had on that we should have on? And we'll throw out to them, like, here's the miniseries we're doing. Tell us which ones you want to do. And yeah. it was one of those things. It's not like you, you, you were like our 20th choice for Lolita. I don't want to make it sound no, like... No, 25th maybe. But it was a thing when we were throwing to people the full list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one wanted to touch it. Or people would go like, I would do this, this, or Lolita. Yeah. And if we circled back to them and said... Hey, a lot of interest in those other two. Would you do Lolita? They'd be like, never mind. I actually don't want to do Lolita. Yeah, so I'm, then I'm brave. Very quickly, we said, who's the bravest person we know? Yep. Who knows mm-hmm. books like a motherfucker? Yep. Who's got a giant lolly? Who's got a giant lolly? That's yep. me. Um, yep. and, and as we know, anytime Fran Hoffner comes on the show, he fucking suplexes Lin-Manuel wow. Miranda in the ratings. True. Sure. Yeah. I don't, really, I don't really want Lin to think there's some kind of rivalry. Between us, I do see us There's as no rivalry. You, as, I see us as equals. You're not. You're much more powerful a draw <laughs> for this show than he I'm is. so sure. Yeah. Uh, Fran, is there anything you want to plug? Fran Magazine. I'll plug Fran Magazine, my little old Substack. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it. Read the read the lolly piece on Gawker. Oh yeah, on Gawker.com, you can read about my six days with my lollipop, including a nice little visit. My brother had to the city while I was shout out Owen shout out Owen while I was going through this funny to explain to someone not 
sort of all about self-sabotage for comedy, uh, how and why you self-sabotage for comedy. It's really hard explaining it to the normals. Yeah, you just, it's it's like science, but less rewarding because yeah. nothing good comes out of it. You're just like, well, we'll see what happens. And my and, misery. Yeah. It's an experiment where you know the outcome. And totally. you hope that people enjoy the outcome. Here's what here's a great part of the mm. stick of uh, the lollipop that I didn't make it in the story is the stick, which is that when you have a lollipop that big, stick is made of wood. Sure. Small lollipop, you got a paper stick. It starts to wilt. Starts to wilt, tastes horrible in your mouth. Yes. Wood lollipop stick, fine. Pretty good. Not bad. Huh. That's a ringing endorsement. Everything else about it, not good. I don't like lollipops for the reason you articulated. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, down. I don't even really like hard candy. So this was really. I love cough drop. The minute you, I like a cough drop, but the minute you unwrap a lollipop, it's like, well, now I've got this fucking thing to deal with. Right. It's yeah. the Kanye West tweet the about lolli- that. Now the I'm responsible bottle. for this water bottle. <laughs> I mean, back when he was funny. Yeah, not a psycho. He was <sighs> a little bit of a psycho. Thank you, Fran. Whatever. Oh, thank, thank you all you. for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media and helping to produce the show. Thank you to Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork. Lynn Montgomery and the Great American Owl for our theme song. J.J. Birch for our research. And Jim Keen, Alex Barron for our editing. You go to blankcheckpod.com for some links to some real nerdy shit, including Blank Check special features, our Patreon where we do commentaries on franchises along with other things. We're doing the Roger Moore Bond movies. We're saying, give me more. Yeah. But we're also doing the two Cooper bonuses coming up 2010 and Dr. Sleep. And then a mystery one coming later in the year. Uh, Tune in next week. For 3,000 years of longing. And as always, how did they ever make a podcast out of Lolita?